the cognitive complexity of issues that the world faces is more than a single person can process. A single brain that can't actually hold that cognitive complexity. So it requires collective intelligence and collective sense. We're making. probably not going to solve the complex, wicked existential problems we face with individual horsepower playing rivalrous games. We're probably going to need to get together and be able to create a higher form of collective intelligence and sense making. Now what? And how? So the, the answer now what is decentralized collective intelligence. Great. How? How do we do that? Honestly, I'm kind of interested in hearing your narrative. On why sense making is important? Why this question, and I'm not actually going to name the question yet, whatever the question is, why it is not just important but central. What I think the strange attractor that draws us all here together is sense making is about the exploration into what is real. And what is meaningful is bound to what's real. And we find that we have the, at least have the experience of having choice. And we're trying to find out how to orient our choice. And so sense making to inform choice making is what is, what is reality? What is my relationship with reality? What is fundamentally meaningful as a basis for how I can make choices that are more aligned with what I find meaningful. Hmm. Nice. Yeah, I mean, I think mine's probably many layers of abstraction below these framings, although I totally, you know, track and, and appreciate what you guys are also saying. Um, my basic gut sense is, hey, Back to complicated versus complex. Mm. Um, we're probably not going to solve the complex, wicked existential problems we face with individual horsepower playing rivalrous games. We're probably going to need to get together and be able to create a higher form of collective intelligence and sense making. And what I've been seeing lately, paying attention to this space, is it's starting to bubble up, but it feels like a wildly unstable element. And it's breaking my heart slash freaking me out slash concerning me that we, our efforts to create group coherence seem to be going so badly so far. And so I'm deeply committed to figuring out what are the rate limiters slash Achilles heels missing links that can help us at least start, you know, failing forward making new, better, different mistakes, because it feels like our efforts right now are actually just the last half century redux with very little go forward learning happening. So it feels like transformational culture is basically just repeating the baby boomer, hippie, new age traps and just running, into the, running off the road at exactly all the same places there's already the skid marks. And so talking with you guys, I find incredibly valuable um, on what are the big systemic issues, what are other ways to think of this, and how do we help give more people, in your terms, the generator functions, to keep figuring this out together um, and make newer, better, more spectacular errors, just not the same old tired, predictable ones. <laughs> I mean, my, my, uh, my path here, I think, is in fact, it may be identical, but my experience of it, or the way I would even describe it, is very first person, which is that my path here is through a very, very large number of distinct personal failures. Like just running into a wall and going, okay, well, that's wrong, turning a little bit, running into another wall, that's wrong, turning a little bit, running into another wall. Like the number of times that I have fucked up is insane. Like I, I came in like thousands, if not tens of thousands. It's crazy. And, um, in the process of that, for example, this is like a good case study, one of the things they ended up getting a hold of was the notion that you could actually do things where you could imagine what the consequences of, of your actions might be quite a distance down the road. And you could actually get really, really good at that to the point where you could actually sit there and hear somebody describe a plan to you. And you could listen to the plan and go, that won't work. 
right? And be very confident that in fact that plan's not a good plan. I mean, an example might be, I'm going to walk up to the fireplace and point my hands at it and say, light. And I'll say, well, you know, that's not gonna work. I've got a good model of how reality works. I've done this sort of thing before, bad plan. Right? So what I'd found though was that <clears throat> as I absorbed more and more life experience and more and more knowledge, I began to be noticed that more and more often, more and more people's plans were of that sort. And then I was like, oh, that's interesting. So I took that as an object of inquiry. And by the way, again, my own being first and foremost. Um, so okay, shit, long-term planning is not working out. So I got, you know, kept going, okay, how can you actually make effective choices? How can you actually plan at all about what's gonna happen in the future? And what I began to notice was the stuff we've been talking about. Like everything that we currently believe that we can plan won't work. Like none of the stuff that we have in our toolkit that allows us to make plans for the future is gonna work out. Fill in the blank. Like pick any problem. I kept running into situations where people describe a particular problem. Everything. We're gonna solve climate. We're gonna solve conflict. We're gonna solve education. And I just kind of listened to them talk about their plan and go like, well, that's not gonna work. Not only is that not gonna work, it's gonna work like terribly. What's happening? So this led me to then finally looking at it, okay, what might? And then that began the process of saying, okay, how do we actually get to the point where we can begin to get some level of clarity on what might actually be a meaningful step? And that leads me here. That, this is the answer to that question. The answer of recognizing that um, the question of sense-making together is ultimately a question of how do I make better choices and how do I and you become a we who make better choices, hopefully in some context that builds to us collectively actually being able to make the kinds of better choices that are truly responsive to the environment we find ourselves in. Like it's just sort of the first step of that cycle. The way I've been describing it is, I do it in a historical narrative, which is to say that there was a, a method of human beings coming together into a group that had certain adaptive capacities that I'm going to call the, the Dunbar coherence. Uh, and this is what we've talked about, is like that thing that happened somewhere around the um, Paleolithic transition, the upper Paleolithic transition, where humans suddenly kicked into something that was kind of a new thing. Um, culture. Right? The human animal began to kick ass. So I'm going to call that the Dunbar coherence. And that was really effective. And that blew all over the world. Humanity covered the whole, whole globe, filled every niche, became the pea predator in every niche, until somewhere in the range of 35,000-ish years ago, it started running into itself. Right? So it was able to outcompete every other organism on the planet until it ran into itself. And so when humans were in the Dunbar Coherence, ran into other humans were in the Dunbar Coherence, and they were so successful that their population began rising beyond the carrying capacity of the environment that they were in, i.e. they entered into self-created conditions of real scarcity, then they had to start competing with each other. And this led to a next wave of evolutionary exploration for trying to find something that was a more effective way for human beings to come together and work together than the Dunbar Coherence. That's game A. Right? Game A is a solution to the problem of how do you get people to be able to work together effectively as a group at scale. Right? And so Dunbar, the limitation of the Dunbar coherence was that it couldn't scale past about 150 people. So Harari, Harari posits basically he, he reduces it all massively and says it's our ability to gossip. I don't think that's yeah. that reductio is really bad yeah, from yeah. my perspective. Uh, it's a lot of stuff like our ability to embody models of other people's states and the state of all the combinatorial relationships they have, as an example. Like, there's a lot of stuff going on. But in any event, Game A then says, all right, how do I solve the problem of scale while maintaining the benefits of people working together? All right, and this is the three problems. How do I actually create something where the group is effectively able to actually support itself in the context of nature? How do I create a condition where it doesn't eat itself from the inside? How do I avoid corruption, infection, and things like that? And how do I actually create enough power inside that, that group that it can actually compete now with other groups? Right? Now, of course, we have the whole story of game A playing out over time. The solution that game A comes up with is this entire story. This society, 
mind, paradigms. I think of it as like almost computational actuation that simplifies human relationships and puts them in very simple relationships that have inputs and outputs, formal structures, money, law, anything that can fit in a semantic narrative that actually can be really held by a person in teaching. You've written that in a book and repeat it over and over again and simplify. There's a lot to it, but I, want, I mean, we don't have forever. So then we fast forward and say, okay, game A has a whole bunch of things inside its possibility space. So it can deliver on the Ming Dynasty and Rome and the Prussians and 21st century U.S. Right? Those are all inside the thing that game A can be, but they're all variations on that theme. We come to where we are now, the problems that we're facing are a different set of problems. Right? And the problems we run into now is that game A in and of itself can't ultimately deal with complexity. Both complexity in terms of actually being able to take full closed loop responsibility for the, for the natural environment. Every instantiation of game A that has ever shown up has always ultimately depleted the resources of the environment that it's sitting on top of to a level of collapse of some sort. Couldn't feed enough people, either produced too, too many people or depleted the resources. It can't deal with complexity on the inside, meaning that it always goes through some kind of group selection on the interior, um, corruption, uh, defection dynamic that leads to fragility that causes it to collapse on the outside. And then the third is the thing that we talked about, which is that precisely because it is so effective at power on an underlying premise of win-lose dynamics, meaning remember it was invented for the purposes of competing with other people in a context of scarcity, as it actually has become extremely powerful, this is the problem of becoming godlike at the level of power, but not at the level of wisdom. Right? So game A runs to the limits of its, of its boundary conditions. It can't solve those three fundamental problems in and of itself. So something new has to be developed. So we say, okay, well, that's game B. Just literally, we're just defining a place. It's a pointer to something over here. So we're like, well, what is that? The first thing is the reason why we can name it game B is to say, well, it's something that is, in fact, a different game altogether. All right, so go all the way to the basis. It's something on the order of magnitude of the difference between the band level nomadic Dunbar 150 human level and every single thing that has happened in civilization since then. Right? That whole box is different, right? that order of magnitude. And it has characteristics that allow it to actually, actually address these three questions. Anthrocomplexity, natural complexity, and the problematic of exponential technology that comes from learning. Right? It's okay, what does that look like? What are some characteristics of that? And that's some of the things we've been talking about today. Right? At the center of it, for me at least, as I've gone through the questioning of this over and over and over again, I've recognized, for example, that you have to change the mind, otherwise you just recapitulate the society, um, is this thing that we've been calling coherent collective intelligence. And coherence, specifically, is at the very center of it. Um, but in many ways, Game B, we even talked about, has a bit of that Taoist sense to it. As you're naming it in the context of game A, quite often you're actually importing game A into it. So you have to actually treat it very, very carefully. It's less about being able to describe it than it is, in fact, just being able to do it. It is the kind of thing that you do, not the kind of thing that you talk about. You can talk about how you can become capable of it, but designing it, talking about it, is generally a full fundamental error. Does that, does that make sense what I'm saying there? I mean, I think it just depends on how Taoist we imagine game B to be. Well, that's very odd because it, it can't actually be Taoist, interestingly enough, but it can actually be, it's more like the Taoist insight that points to the Tao. But I can say it very clearly. If I could articulate it, by definition, it's complicated. It's not complicated. Game B is not complicated. Game B must be intrinsically complex. So I cannot define it in any finite set of statements. Because any finite set of statements is complicated. So it's not that kind of thing. So if I'm explaining it, if I'm describing it, I have to be doing it in something which is essentially poetic, not a specification. Or as Daniel said, I'm pointing towards the generator functions that give rise to something that is more than the thing that is said. I'm noticing three distinct things that come up. One is the question of why, why this thing, which I'll just call coherence, that we've been talking about. The, the second is, why does it, 
thus far fail to scale. Um, and then of course the third is how might we go about solving that problem? All three seem to be showing up close to each other in my sense. Do you want to share more what you mean by coherence? Right, immediately what <laughs> comes up. Uh, so what is this thing? And there's a lot of different ways of talking about it, but we might say that it is... <sighs> actually, it's interesting. It seems like you actually have to talk about it in many different ways because it is the kind of thing that cannot be conveyed effectively in language. You know, it's the matrix. Unfortunately, no one can be told what coherence is. But we can actually tell a lot of different stories. It's uh, become the blind man with the elephant. And after a little while, we might be able to, in ourselves, grasp perhaps what is being pointed at. So one way of describing it is it is a... It's a form of collective intelligence that it has as a characteristic a high degree of capacity in the space of novelty and a intrinsic anti-fragility in both human anthropo complexity and nature complexity. Another way of saying that is if you work backwards in taking a look at all the different challenges and problems that we are currently facing, we meaning humanity, it is the answer to the set that contains those problems. Another way of describing it is it's something like flow, since we have that as a nice concrete frame and we can evoke that, um, in an unconstrained way, i.e. we oftentimes associate with flow with flow in a domain. A rock climber is in flow when climbing rocks. A uh, jazz band is in flow when playing jazz. Coherence is flow. Absent context? Absent a particular or application. Yeah. yeah. So you mentioned the, um, you said it has a relationship with novelty. What, what prompts you to put that into the mix? Because if I just hear the word coherence, that just feels like, you know, from, from physics, electronics, whatever, it would just be things in some form of sync with each other. But you added in novelty and anti-fragility and both of those seem interesting, but they're not what I would have just expected to come from the word. So can you help unpack either the why or the how you got to those? Yeah, I think also to begin, it's, I think what you bring up is good, which is to say that there's different kinds of collective intelligence and some kinds of collective intelligence we have different names for them. We might call them different things. So in this context, we're going to have to be very familiar with the notion that word choice is oftentimes going to require some careful definition, as you just did. So let's just, for everyone who's listening, just recognize that oftentimes I have a certain vocabulary, Daniel has a vocabulary, you have a vocabulary. We're all operating under what I've called rule omega, which is listen to what is being expressed, not what is being said and ask good questions until what is being expressed is actually felt, it's landed. So if we think about the examples of flow that you've provided so well, one of the things that shows up so commonly is a sense of there being an emergence or a synergy where there's something about a whole that is greater than the sum of the parts. And that, as it turns out, happens to be the best way to respond to novelty. Let me add some words that I think um, might add clarity to the a question I hear you asking. We've discussed uh, offline some different types of coherence in different contexts and like formal models for looking at what coherence in different contexts means. And so when you mention 
like physics, like things of the same type, like pendulums or lasers, mm -hmm. that's a coherence of sameness. They all become the same wavelength. They have the same periodicity. And when we're talking about humans being able to come into coherence, we're not wanting a homogenizing coherence. And if you think about something like a body, liver cells and neurons and fat cells are all very different types of cells, and yet they're operating in a way where the body is an emergent property that has capacities that none of the cells or organs or subsystems taken separately have. So it's a coherence of different things where the difference is the basis of synergy rather than being the basis of an unreconcilable conflict. Can you say that again? The difference is a basis for synergy where each of them have capacities separately and then the whole has capacities neither of them had that are found in each of them plus the relationships mm -hmm. as opposed to the differences being a basis for unreconcilable conflict. So we're interested here in the types of coherence that can occur where there are differences, right? Differences of experience, differences of perspective. And yet, like, so I'll just tie a couple other words together that Jordan said. He said it's kind of like flow. If we think of flow from fluid dynamics in terms of like laminar flow versus turbulent flow, there's a more flow is less entropy. And actually not just less entropy, but syntropy, the movement towards holes that are greater than some of the parts. And so I think that's what we're really interested in, in collective sense making, is how do we come together in relationship mm. that has less friction, less entropy relationally, more syntropy where the group of us has capacities, has emergent properties that aren't found in any of us in isolation. That coherence is that phenomena that emergent properties arise from. Right, and then so the, the other distinction was you know, we've, got, we've got examples of this kind that have the, now we're actually having to get pretty nuanced, so we might as well just be careful of the fact that we're getting nuanced. We have a, a particular kind of coherence. I'm just gonna label coordination, just so we have a label for it. And this has a lot of what Daniel's talking about. In fact, it, it has emergent properties. So for example, if you've got a, a mathematician having a conversation with an economist, there's in fact a, a, a hole in their conversation that is greater than the sum of the parts. Right? There, there's, there's a connection between those two ways of thinking. The, the toolkits of mathematics that's not available to the economist unlocks things that the economist wouldn't have known about. But for example, the economist's questions that weren't things that the mathematician was thinking about unlocks things the mathematician wasn't thinking about. Right? So there's a synergy value to that. That's also not the thing we're talking about. That's awesome, really good, useful. But for very specific reasons, which we can go to if we'd like, um, it doesn't actually have the capacity to, to satisfy the requirements of, call it, the problems that we're facing. It can't satisfy, satisfy the problems of nat natural complexity. It can't satisfy the problems of anthropo complexity, one of which is why it keeps breaking down. Every time we try to build something like this, anthropocomplexity complexity oftentimes becomes the primary reason why it breaks down. Yeah, I mean, it seems like, if, I, if I'm hearing right, the question is just how, how can we get together with each other in a way that leaves us smarter, kinder, more creative, more courageous, more resilient than any of us are apart. And me, at least as far as terms, for me, flow is often a bit of a buzzword. And I think a lot of people project onto it, but some slightly more precise, like if I'm thinking of examples, and you can tell me if I'm barking up the right tree or not, but like examples I think of is Victor Turner's notion at University of Chicago of communitas, which is a, it's not simply a collection. It's not just a crowd or a mob. It's a felt presence of coherence among a group and then you think about like Quakers use the term a gathered meeting there's a regular meeting we all shuffle into the meeting house no one says much mm. right? and and people or even people may say a few things and that cannot be a gathered meeting that's just a physical collection of humans on a Sunday morning but a gathered meeting is there you know over centuries of really delicate listening into that is the place where 
you're speaking only when spoken through. And that the collective intelligence is given voice through a given individual, but it's clearly not just their thoughts, ideas, or words. Does that track? Yes. For you guys? Okay. Um, now I know, obviously, analogies of humans and brains and minds to computers are obviously problematic at a whole bunch of different levels. But as far as a simple one, does this also seem to be the notion of connecting CPUs or computers in serial such that the connected computational power and capacity is greater than any of the things in between and that they might actually even be able to tackle problems that an any individual computer would be incapable of solving? Actually, no. And that goes back to the notion of coordination. So that style of connection is coordination. And it does have the characteristic of increasing capacity. Um, and in fact, increasing capacity in a fashion that is, well, at least depending on the specific kind of problem and the physical capacity to do compute, oftentimes a better topology for solving particular kinds of problems. Does that make sense what I just said? It does. I'm just wondering, is there a magic in the supercomputer? Is there a, like, for instance, if all I can do is, I mean, let's go back 20 years, you know, and if all I could do was do email and AOL, you know, but if we connected enough of them together, we can actually project a hologram and actually, you know, model something totally new and different that none of those things could do. I mean, if, if, it's, if it's a problematic metaphor, we can abandon it. I'm just thinking. No, like, it's, a very, thing, it's a very good it, metaphor right? and problematic. Yeah. So it's, it's, yeah. we don't want to abandon it. We actually want to have it be helpfully. Double worked. click on why. Yeah. There are elements of parallel processing and elements of serial processing mm -hmm. that are important. And then there's something that can't be fully contained in parallel and serial. And the thing that I am sensing Jordan's calling coherence is what is, are we, do we have a model where we're reducing consciousness to computation? And if not, what consciousness is other than computation is part of the limits of that model. Yeah. And I don't know where this comes from, but I think it might be Jungian analysis perhaps but the notion of the third they talk about in like dyadic relationships and sometimes they'll even do couples therapy where they're it's almost like you know up a, a plate for elijah or you know <laughs> like a seat for elvis it's like there's the third and the third is the intelligence of the relationship mm -hmm. and is the third you know a working place the idea that there is between and among us but not specific to any of us an additional intelligence that can emerge and that is that, that is that the differentiator between what you were describing as coherence and simply maybe collective intelligence or problem coordination. solving here or coordination? Yep. That's okay. a very, I'm going to say yes. Okay. Does that track you? Yeah. And so I'm wanting to translate to different ontologies listeners might be coming from and say there's a couple, at least a couple different ways we can think about this, both of which are meaningful. So... There's a question of, can we come into a type of relationship as beings where there is a kind of synergy, a kind of coherence, where there's actually an emergent property of something ontic that then has a top-down effect in us. We can actually listen to that. And there's some interesting kind of metaphysical propositions that would make that be the case. And I would say that's interesting. And then there's also the, well, if that's not true and mind is still processing in separate brains, is there still something where intending to listen into the group as opposed to just myself and just having the intention to consider the perspectives of everyone there, consider the relationships between everyone there, consider the group as a whole, not just the individuals and the individuals and speak what could be relevant and useful for everyone and feel, think about that and feel into it, use your whole self. I don't have to have a ontology of an emergent collective consciousness to have that process be a useful thing. So is there a point, Jordan, is, is it helpful or problematic to consider? So let's say what you just said, which is let's call it um, super skillful, active, collective listening, right? Where it's, it, you, you can take first person, second person, third person perspectives fluidly in order to help both, you know, 
articulate, extract, make sense of as much information and, and sense making as we can together. That feels sort of secular humanist rational. That's just us being better people, playing better together. Is there anything to, what is gained and lost by positing the third, positing a um, transpersonal element that may even render us our individuality subordinate to? So clearly, right? So, so in a lot of traditional societies, they might have some wild ass crazy ritual, like you know, Haitian voodoo or something like that. And there may be the, the, there is a God or a spirit that this ritual is dedicated to. And when enough of us lose our separate sense self, they would, they would tell the story or make the meaning that that is when the spirit of such and such has come through, right? If we're talking about post rational coherence, is there a thing that is superordinate to us? If so, is that helpful in the sense of like, get out of the way, right? We're laying in the mothership or is it problematic because it creates magical thinking, projections and other stuff? Well, interestingly, I think we actually have a nice self-referentiality that just happens right here because, so the first step might be something like, something I call a paradigm mapping. And Daniel actually did paradigm mapping a moment ago. So you take a particular story that somebody's telling and you point by point map it to a particular paradigm. So I could describe that in terms of cognitive science and say, okay, what's really happening is that when we create a proposition that there's a third, what this does in our own minds is that it allows us to no longer have an emotional attachment to the rightness or the wrongness of a particular idea, which gives rise to a cognitive capacity to be more creative and more fluid in explorations, and therefore it is a more generative way. It's a, it's a form of hack that allows us to have that cognitive disposition. Right? So I just did a mapping to a kind of language in cognitive science that would some, take somebody who loads and runs cognitive science as a sense-making framework and make them go, okay, that makes sense, feels good. My, I don't feel scared or angry about what's happening right now. That feels like a, a feasible thing. But of course, the meta proposition is that mapping it to a paradigm full stop at all is the problem. So anytime you're actually trying to make sense by mapping to a paradigm, whether the paradigm is a you know, Vishnu or the god Pan or cognitive neuroscience or whatever, you're already recapturing the discourse in a particular way of thinking that limits its capacity to be the thing we're trying to actually do. So the answer to the question is, like if the answer to the question is like the classic Buddhist just whack you in the back of the head, yeah, yeah. like that's the only real response to that kind of a question is don't go that direction. Sure. Okay. So, so yes. And then, but he, so if, Coherence is this ephemeral emergent property, best never named, never subject to right. reality capture, reality tunnel capture, like yes. it's that thing. Then how the hell do you scale it? Because we're storytelling monkeys. And at some point we need recipes to help the thing propagate. So this goes Unless back to everybody's the just of Yoda Zen. Why does it always break down? Mm -hmm. why, do, why every time we try to scale does it break down? One of the reasons is because as our friend Lao Tzu discovered, and by the way, also our friend Buddha discovered and our friend Jesus discovered, every time the storytelling monkeys try to turn into a story to tell, they fuck it up. So let's be mindful of that and recognize that the storytelling piece of it definitely isn't the answer. Okay, so Sherlock Holmes style. We've now carved that out of the available portfolio of things that we can do. How do we go about doing anything at all that doesn't involve being a storytelling monkey? Okay, we've got a, we've got a narrow problem. It's, it's smaller, it's a smaller space. But you know, so, so let's just think, I mean, if, if, you know, where we are culturally these days is a lot of people are stumbling into these spaces via broad access to ecstatic technologies. So whether that's transformational festivals or, you know, transformational technologies or whatever it is, or, or psychopharmacology, yep. you know, all these things, people are bumbling into these spaces on purpose or not. They're getting there. They're recognizing, holy shit, we're in the deep end. And or this is rad, this is awesome, this is terrifying, this is powerful, right? Whatever it will be, they, they know it when they're getting there, even if they're not 100% sure of how they got there. 
And then the moment they're no longer in that coherent field, we're back to trying to make sense of it in the prison house of language, telling stories and making analogies or metaphors. So let's make a distinction. I think we have this distinction I think is quite helpful. Um, there's at least two distinct uses of language. This one over here, I'll call semantic reality mapping. This is really good for things like building houses or putting together battle plans. It orients coordinated behavior where the checksum of reality is pretty strong. Science does a lot of this. Science is pretty much this kind of thing. Over here is poetry, parable, where the finger's pointing to the moon, and the point is the moon, not the finger. This we can use. We just have to be very careful that we're not doing this. So the problem that I think happens all the time, particularly with the folks that wear lots of feathers and like to take too many drugs, is they do this. So they have an experience, and then try to turn it into a science. So it's prescriptive versus descriptive. Both, really. They mistake one for the other. They do prescription and description, because poetry is not really description. It's evocative. Figurative versus literal. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So the, the trick is we have to actually be able to use language as some way of creating a, a resonance frequency or protocol match that generates a capacity for communication that is not itself specifically semantic. which I would propose both parable and poetry do. It orients you in the direction of a feeling in yourself. Like think about poetry. When you read a poem, you don't understand the poem, but there's something about the way that the poem coordinates language helps you orient in yourself to an experience that feels like the feeling that the poet was also feeling. And so it creates a possibility of there being a connection at the level of interior feeling, not a connection at the level of understanding. Well, some, something you, I mean, it felt like you did have some future forward practicality and application in your initial description. You said it, it does well with novelty and it's anti-fragile. And there's me as you've thought of it, feel like timeless qualities, but it for sure feels important now and going forward. And, and I was wondering because if we can't do the, here's the instructions on how to get back here, because then we've named a thing that's not the thing. And emergent coherence is kind of this weird, slippery thing to pin down. You have communities of practice, like, Quakers and others that have spent centuries and even you know generations passing on that knowledge. I was just with um, some indigenous folks, Diné and Lakota folks, right? And they have an infinite tradition of we will talk until the thing that needed to get done emerges. But nor are we on the clock. And if this takes 10 minutes, so be it. If this takes 10 days, so be it. So is there a version of this that is, you know, kind of quote unquote scalable in the 21st century for our current situations and conditions and also nervous systems and time scales slash distractibilities or are those incompatible? And we actually need to say if you humans, groups of humans care about the possibility space that coherence might afford us, then you're going to need to unplug and have a different value set than contemporary mainstream norms and bit rates. To me, the answer is pretty simple. Um, if somebody says they want to become a, uh, to play basketball for the, end, for, the, uh, for the Lakers, they probably ought to become a really good basketball player. I mean, the real answer is that these lineage traditions indicate to us that the human instrument has a particular ambient capacity to achieve a th this thing, coherence. Okay, our job is to get really, really good at that, to take that particular ambient capacity and hone it to a level 
that is the equivalent of a contemporary marathon runner or a contemporary sprinter honing the instrument of running in a way that a Stone Age human can't. Become the Usain Bolt of coherence is the answer to the question. It's there. It's clearly possible. You only have to become the Usain Bolt, though. I mean, remember once the five-minute mile, was it the five-minute mile or the three-minute mile? Four-minute four minute mile. Hmm. Once the four-minute mile was broken, which was considered to be impossible, now you've got high school students who can do it. And so it's one of those things where once you actually get to a particular node, there's a, there's a, a, a location in the possibility space of Homo sapiens sapiens that can actually achieve that particular point. Get there and then build the, the techne of that and bring other people into that place and use that to discover how to actually scale it. You're, I, I think you're asking very important and also the hardest questions and we don't have s some of the previous structures together yet that we would need to. So when you talk about how would we have a kind of coherence of collective sense making and collective choice making at scale, well, we've never had it at scale, right? As you're mentioning, there was a certain level that some tribes were able to develop. It was part of how tribal mm -hmm. life happened. And we know that below Dunbar number and above Dunbar number, there's really fundamental differences. And Dunbar number is not a number, it's a range based on the level of coherence of the type of people. More coherence, better communication protocols, slightly bigger number. But one way of thinking about the Dunbar number is a level at which the communication protocols that m mediate the coherence break down, mm -hmm. which is why you're asking the scale question. Mm -hmm. As you mentioned, we'll talk it out if it takes 10 days. If I've got less than 150 people, say, and there's a big decision that's going to affect everybody's life, everyone can actually enter a tribal conversation and all get to be part of something that's going to affect them, which means everyone's sense-making can be held together. This was your question around parallel and series, right? It's like both of those, everybody's sense-making can be heard and then choice-making can factor everybody's sense-making. But if I met thousands of people, there's no way to have everybody talk, to even hear each other without some kind of technology to, and so then tribes got bigger than that by certain kinds of evolutionary forcing functions by instituting things like command and control hierarchy that controlled the communication flows where some people were doing choice making not informed by the sense making of the whole and now you get diminishing returns on collective intelligence and that's been the only scaling methods we've had. And there was that angry gods hypothesis thing that we were... Sure, yeah. There's many different technologies for maintaining that particular style of collective intelligence which of course I could just call game A, like a whole, yeah. a whole way of solving that problem. Yeah, basically game A and scaling coordination are the are pretty synonymous. Scaling coordination beyond the Dunbar number. Huh. Meaning all the other additional bells and whistles of game A, you would, you would assert basically are kind of follow-ons for how do, you, how do you control and coordinate resources and humans beyond 100 to 150. Yeah. Yeah. Money, um, formal hierarchy, the notion of formality in general, the idea that there's a role that somebody fills as opposed to Humans are just humans, and sometimes, like dynamic, from formal subordination to dynamic subordination, that shift. Um, law, policing. Uh, each one of these are just tools in the game of toolkit that are all Shared. endeavoring to solve that problem. Shared in group identity, like political left or nationality or religion or race or whatever. Um, that, that allows a coordination of an in group relative to an out group in an assumed rivalrous context. And so game A is basically rivalrous game theory, is a way of stating it. And sort of it has three distinct challenges that it's always trying to solve for. It's trying to solve for, is it able to coordinate so as to maintain the integrity of the whole in the context of nature? Can it feed everybody? Is it able to coordinate in the context of each other? Is it able to avoid defection or group selection inside its interior? Or just corruption? And is it able to coordinate vis-a-vis -vis other things of the same kind that are doing the same thing that are trying to steal each other's, uh, drink each other's milkshake, All right? And you now have history. And you have the failure of all the previous civilizations because of breakdowns in those three. Yeah. Okay, so then um, let's imagine the game B groovy coherence 
version. How do how do we play this? Let, let's assume that the kind of the cat's out of the bag. People are stumbling and bumbling into at least transient coherence via more and less more or less durable means these days, and that could literally be psytrance at Boom Festival in Portugal plus psychedelics is doing something, and the and the whole reason that there's an even psytrance EDM movement. I can't I can't listen to this stuff personally, but I've heard <laughs> I've heard people who have been skeptical finding themselves in the middle of one of those dance floors with premium function one acoustic tune sound systems, you know, and again, overlaid with psychedelics, overlaid with large crowds of people, light sound, all of those kind of transformative technologies dropping into something. How, what, how do we enter this post-conventional communitas, coherence, whatever it would be, without the moment the kind of the peak of it wears off, reverting back to game A, power structures and game theory. Because that's what I keep seeing. I see people glimpsing it, people being lit up, recognizing it as something new, important, magical, profound, healing, fill in the blank. Starting to even agree to organize around it. We're new family, we're tribe, we're, gonna, we're, we're, we're the frothy edge of evolution, whatever it would be. And then the wheels come off Monday morning when the checks have to be stroked or when the project, you know, the project plans are late or we start getting back into nitty gritty 3D. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. I'll, I, it, this is what I was trying to say earlier, but I'll say it again, but I think maybe more effectively. Um, so when you think about, we've got the concept of game A. So when you think about game A, there's two pieces to it or two aspects or elements. One element is let's just call it society, and the other element here is mind. Right? So there's a particular mind that you're running to be able to run the code of your society. And society is effective to the degree to which it has code that works and minds that run it well. Okay? Well, if you delete this, whoop, but you're still running this. Right? So I've just had my Psytrance experience and I've had connection to the Godhead. And what I do immediately, without even a second's hesitation, is I immediately begin running it on the old code. Yeah. I am recapitulating the old code. Yes. And I'm going to get the same out, no matter what, every time. Um, which is, you know, every single time you see, for example, uh, my, the aforementioned individuals who have been the quote-unquote great teachers of the past, mm -hmm. who studiously didn't write things down, mm -hmm. and immediately were followed by people who did, which immediately became a state religion, which immediately started the process of killing other people in their name. I mean, it's a pretty interesting story how Game Aid does that. So the first answer is... We wanted the Christ. We got Joel Osteen. How do, yeah. How do you not do this? What's another kind of mind you might run? Well, okay, that's actually a very tricky question because to think about it involves invoking the mind that is not to be to get rid of itself. So the answer is... First, slow way the fuck down. Think developmental. Right? We're going to actually have to go all the way down to conception in the developmental pathway and only do that which is in fact actually within the coherence that we have in fact actually have achieved. This is why I said you actually have to go to that center in the build out. So let's say you want to say, okay, we've achieved coherence, now let's build a, I don't know, an organization. That's like saying, I'm a three-month-old, I'm going to go drive a race car. Nope, sorry. What can you do? Maybe you can kind of have a conversation that isn't going into game A. Maybe. Sadly. But development has a really cool thing. You can get better at it. So the first is to actually really recognize the absolute irreducible necessity of comprehensively rebooting mind all the way down. When you say all the way down, down what? Down to childhood and infancy, like early childhood development? I would actually or? go with conception. So Jordan's got infant right now, and we were, so he's very much in that active process of watching and supporting development. We were talking about the other day, uh, 
I don't know if it's true or not, but there's at least a story of some Native American tribes where when they're teaching language, rather than when the kid first starts asking the what questions, what's that, what's that, what's that, rather than say it's a crow and a mountain and a buffalo, they would say that is the great spirit expressed as a crow, the great spirit expressed as a mountain, great spirit expressed as a buffalo. So their initial semiotics, their initial ontology had the interconnectivity of everything first and then the distinction. And so when we say all the way down, it's like to the level of do I identify as a separate self in my own experience that, can get, that is in game theoretic relationship to you and identify you as other? Do I experience that? Or do I experience some kind of deeper connectivity in which synergy is the only thing that makes sense? Okay, so now we're into an interesting neck of the woods. Right? But by the way, just practically speaking though, somewhere around 11, 10, 11, okay. is a good place at the level of mind. From like concrete operational yeah. on up. Uh, noting that you have to also deal with all the stuff that's going on in the body in that pre-period. So if you haven't resolved childhood trauma or anything that's going on in terms of even simple things like bilateral integration due to not the right kind of developmental environment, you're going to have challenges. So you have to actually work with that whole thing. That's my conception. The stuff that happens, those developmental stages, going back and making sure that the instrument is in fact a fully functioning human instrument all the way up. And then of course when you get to that childhood adolescence phase, that's where a lot of the paradigmatic stuff starts to begin to layer in. And of course, everything that you learn from 17, 18 on, you should go ahead and shelve most of that. Shelve it in what way? Uh, like, don't, do allow it, like, don't allow it to make sense of reality. From the, that's the indoctrination into game A formatting? Information, semantic, yes, it's, it's the code. All the code that you've been running that, that partitions reality into prefabricated true and good. Bits and bits. Yes. When okay. you said we're getting somewhere interesting, I wanted mm -hmm. to know where you wanted to go. Yeah, it was, well, it was specifically what you were describing as far as, you know, the apocryphal indigenous traditions, right? That never semantically encoded separation of self. Constantly infused, this is, a, this is, this is great spirit as, a, you know, as an expression. And, 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 you know, presumed or inferred, I think, is a pre-enlightenment, pre-rational sense of selfhood that was actually permeable, liminal. And, you know, this is the bicameral mind, if you know, like it, that, it's that neck of the woods, the idea of, hey, maybe back in the day, humans, no matter how much our Hollywood movies, you know, project back 20th and 21st century values onto our sandal Bible epics, you know, we actually, people conceived of themselves in fundamentally different ways. Their boundaries of self were more permeable and they were able to connect in pre-conventional collective sense, which actually was the subjugation of the self and the subjugation of the of sovereignty because that stuff hadn't even necessarily come online in the ways we tend to think of it. Then you've got, you know, rational French enlightenment, articulation of hyper individual egoic separate selves. And then our efforts in this era, say 1700 to roughly now, right? The only times... Probably the 70s. Yeah, we, we, we've had these, we've had fascism, communism, cults, right? I mean, it was cults and colonies, right? That, that, that notion of the subjugation of the self to the collective, and it's at odds with our value sets and has often been super problematic. So this question is, is how might we, other than just growing your humans, which, you know, I, I hear you saying for, for obvious reasons, yep. um, how might we get to a post-conventional collective coherence that rather than subjugating individual sovereignty actually foregrounds it and pre, you know preserves animates it protects it and at the same time we have that dynamic subordination or you know not game theory capture we play well with each other no one fucking grabs the ring right and we all create the the council of elrond so you just set up hyper individualism and some kind of oneness or collectivism as a thesis antithesis and you're asking about synthesis it's one way of framing it mm -hmm. and so far in the conversation for whatever reason you've been doing a beautiful job of asking questions but i kind of want to 
aspect, since I know this is exactly the center of what you're focused on, how do you see that synthesis emerging? Beats me, man. I mean, I, I feel like, to your point, a little bit like we have to train and we have to practice. You know, you said everyone's going to become Usain Bolt, but like you can't make a soccer team with Usain Bolt. <laughs> There's only one of those sons of bitches that he's faster than everybody else, <laughs> right? And so I, I, honest to God, don't know. It feels like there needs, I mean, as, as, like I hear what you're saying from the kind of full on like Zen Cohen of it, like don't name the thing. And on the other hand, if we are looking to migrate people into at least beginning to practice it together, however messily and imperfectly, what are the liberating structures? What are the rules to the infinite game, right? Even if baked into the rules of the infinite game are it's not the rules either. Sure. Um, how can we do that so that um, we don't have these glimpses of something more shared between us that continually seem to unspool and you know and here's, here's a few that I've seen I mean I think the key thing is to recognize that obviously we don't know how because otherwise we already would have and that's core, crucial um, it's important so it's worth continuing to try which of course all of us know intuitively but I think it's important to keep putting it out there and my sense is at least my own personal experience is that it's becoming more clear like, I, I don't feel like I've been wandering in the desert, coming back to the same place now. It feels like actually there is more and more clarity. So I'll, I'll give you some examples of things that seem to be more right than wrong. So one is, let's just take like, the concept of learning. And what I want to do is I want to, I want to shift, and this is not novel, like this happens, but it's, it's, I think it's key is just to hold things in the right order. The difference between teaching and cultivating epiphany. Right, so teaching is, I give you a set of information, I, through any particular means, generally wrote, um, endeavor to cause you to be able to repeat that information back to me and verify that you've absorbed it in a way that has high fidelity. Right, so it is coding, it's software. Right? I'm creating some sort of software mapping in you. In cultivating epiphany, I try to find somehow to actually generate in you the insight that gave rise to that being the thing in the first place. Right? So it's not even teach a man to fish, but cultivate in a man the, the capacity of becoming fisherman in himself. Right? That distinction is definitely one of the distinctions. Generator function more than output. That's a way of putting it. Okay, and then, oh, we're gonna say something? I've got some thoughts on how to do that synthesis. Oh, sweet. But you said that was one of the distinctions. No, I think this this useful thing of saying, hey, here's the, here's the stuff I've found. Yeah. And you know, most of it has been a disaster. But there's a few that actually kind of work. So let's, let's, let's see what else we got. Okay, so here's a few. We talked about coherence of difference rather than coherence of sameness. And like heterogeneous coherence? Correct. So when you're talking about the subordination of the individual versus individuality, there's something having to do with that there is a uh, meaningfulness and a beauty and a dignity of the individual that we don't want to subordinate in some kind of homogenizing way. We don't want to decrease the diversity that leads to the resilience of life. Right? And the richness of it. But and my own discernment and choice making, even as I'm part of a collective, that feels really important. Right. And then simultaneously, um, there are kinds of diversity and difference that only lead to unreconcilable entropic conflicts. Mm -hmm. And so those are not interesting kinds of diversity. And so we want as much diversity as we can create synergy across. We get maximum synergy from maximum diversity with maximum parallax. So now think about for a moment with the idea of parallax. Look, and just, just define that for folks like more. So parallax in terms of the way the two eyes, neither eye has depth perception or peripheral vision, right? And when I have both eyes together, they, they have a lot of shared things that they see, but because they're in different locations, they also have slightly different things that they see. So there's overlap, but difference. 
right? And this is important. So when I put the two together, they're not competing for which one is right. That would be ridiculous, right? They're actually, sh the optical cortex is putting the information together in a way where if there's actually an error in this one, it's corrected by what this one's doing. So they error correct each other. And then because I can compute the hypotenuse of the triangle, I actually get depth perception and periphery. So the two eyes together give things that neither of them did separately, plus error correction. So I want them to have some shared reality, and I want them to find their shared reality, but I also want them to have difference, and then I want them to relate in a deep way. And then I wouldn't want my ears to be more eyes, right? Like there's a deeper kind of parallax between ears and eyes where eyes are giving me location of things and ears are giving me a different kind of location of things. So the ears with each other give me echolocation and the ears and the eyes together give me a different kind of sense making in three space. So we are Mr. Potato Head. Mm -hmm. So if you think about like every, imagine if the ears and eyes were just fighting over which was right and the other one was, one was comprehensively right and a complete description of reality and the other was comprehensively wrong, that would be ridiculous. We would dissolve into gibberish, right? There is a place where they all have accurate information about reality and it's all partial. This speaks to then that notion of like the third that you mentioned. So in the context, in the relationship between the eyes and the ears, there's a third. We know that third. That's our experience. Our umwelt, yeah. Right. So then the question is, okay, you be eyes, I'll be ears. Where's our third? And what's neat about that is that then you get some very interesting things where on the one hand, you have, both of us actually, have a clear awareness in ourselves that we are here to, with fidelity, report what we perceive of reality. We are deeply cognizant of the fact that that is not reality. Mm -hmm. We are deeply cognizant of the fact that the other is here to report reality and that somehow there is something that can happen that gives a deeper grasp of reality. And the reason why I'm zoning in on that is that it actually, a lot of the characteristics of this kind of place have to do with a, a way to fully and deeply honor like all the shit you know without the least bit of attachment to any of it. And that's key, right? You have to actually, we're not in the, it's not the pre, it's the trans. So we actually want to know lots of stuff. We want to have really amazing frameworks. We want to have a lot of life experience. We want to bring that all the way in. But then we also then want to have complete non-attachment to any of it and be able to sort of create a bespoke synth synthetic language in real time if necessary. Okay, so that's kind of interesting. I mean, I loved all of that. Okay, so I want to add something to this because this is actually, like, this is really exciting to me. So I've got lots of senses, right? And they're all taking in some true information. They can all have error and they're all partial. I also have lots of actuator. I can move lots of different muscles. And of course, the, the leg doesn't want the, to compete with the arm for which one gets to be the actuator. It actually wants to not just coordinate, but to be in a kind of coherence, right? And so I've got lots of sensory stuff. I've got lots of actuator stuff. Why is it that it's not just random splotches of color and sound, but it comes together into a coherence of self and world and self in relationship with world is a coherence phenomena. So how all the sensing comes together inside of me is a coherence phenomena. That's the binding problem in neuroscience, right? And in the philosophy of mind. And then the actuator, why am I not, how do all those parts work together so well as a coherence phenomena? So if we think about that every human on their own at the next level up is sensing, making sense and actuating. But then when we come together, like I want you sensing stuff differently than I am. And I trust that there is information in that that I actually really want to, to have access to myself and I want the collective to have and I want you actuating differently than I am. But I really want to come into coherence. Mm -hmm. So it almost, I mean, I wasn't kind of like that, that, the joke about Mr. Potato Head is actually kind of like, who is the third, right? <laughs> if we personify, and it sounds like, so we're all different organs, bringing different perspectives. When we come together, we get dimensionality, right? We get, whether it's echolocation or binocular vision, we get more out of aggregating and integrating 
our realities, that then becomes, as you said, not just fragmented data feeds, it becomes a, a gestalt umbel. It becomes a, the re reality for some suprasensible version of us that is greater than the sum of its parts. Yeah? So, you said initial conditions, good with novelty and anti-fragile. But what, and then you also said, hey, the mind that's running, like you take the societal structure off, but the mind, the mind that was formatted to support the social structure persists, even if you have this experience, it's going to get looped back through old, fundamentally game-a habits and patterns, which sounds super fucking fragile. Because, right, like, like right now, coherence is highly, highly fragile. Oh, yes. And yet you're also saying it either has an inherent property or maybe you just hope that it would be ultimately, eventually, anti-fragile. Can we pull that apart? Because I think we um, wouldn't be having this conversation if it was a done deal yeah. or if the first time people glimpsed it, we're like, fucking got it, let's go rock with this. This is actually wildly delicate right now. Yeah, I think it's, if, you, if you hold in your mind the, the example that Daniel gave, that this happens to be like the best current example of coherence, and it really is, like Ridiculous. in the entire universe as far as we know it, by the best actual example of coherence. <laughs> um, and then we say, okay, well, if we do the anthropology, and we take a look back and say, okay, well, how long did it take to pull that shit together? Um, Finding, remember I had that spot in possibility space. So imagine a cube. And in that cube, let's make the cube 1 million by 1 million by 1 million. So it's a big cube. Okay. And all, all over there are different kinds of uh, phenotypes. Hominids happen to be a sphere about a thousand by a thousand by a thousand in that cube. Mollusks are down here. Right? Inside the sphere of hominid, there's an even smaller sphere which is Homo sapiens, which is maybe five by five by five in terms of the possibility space. And of course- You're talking sentient biomass? What's your, what's your million cube? My cube is the, uh, well, it's actually an n-dimensional space, but I'm reducing it to three to make it work. So don't put indexes on it, otherwise it's- Don't talk, don't talk down to me. Metaphor exam, doesn't, exam, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't hold. It's so the, uh, how do you find in the totality of all the things that are going on, a particular complex that hangs together to achieve a particular um, homeostatic autocatalytic phenomenon that has the thing necessary for it to actually hold coherently. Right? So what happens is, is that there's a lot of different exploration around this little place. Just think of it as a place. If you're not a, of sapiens, right? So in hominid, you got primate and you got hominid and you smaller and smaller. In, in, in hominid, there's all these sort of explorations of, okay, how does this thing, what, what are the different ways of playing this hominid game? And as you kind of get closer to the, the location of Homo sapiens, you got you know, Homo erectus, right? And you got Homo heidelbergensis. There's a, some things come together, but it takes like a million and a half years to actually land on, boop, there's the thing that actually has all the different elements together. By the way, metacontextually, it has not just the physiological cap capacities, but it also has grandmothers and fathers who can actually support the neo neotenic necessity for this plasticity to be able to actually emerge with culture. Right? So there's a bunch of shit that's been put together through evolutionary process. It's exploring the space of possibility. And as it kind of hits, there's enough bending of the space of possibility until it orbits around that spot. All right? Now, if you take that, we're looking at something which is inside that Homo sapiens sapiens spot. And I might hypothesize, by the way, has been there the whole time, which just finds a meta arc coming here, but we're not going to go into teleology. That is, maybe it's one by one. Right? It's a small territory. But we can notice when, so first, we can use that as an example of saying, okay, this is how hard it is. So we're going to kind of vector in that direction, and we'll kind of like, Buddhism will emerge and kind of move the game forward a little bit, and we'll kind of learn some interesting stuff, and then collapse, and Christianity will happen, and it'll kind of do its thing, and a big level up occurs in the general sort of state of Homo sapiens, but we don't quite get there. So now we're at this point where we're like, all right, given everything we know, and given the time frame that we think we may have actually to pull this off, what's the process by which we explore it? And of course, again, the point that I'm saying is, to the degree to which as an individual you can put yourself inside the sphere that defines this location, you can get there. 
then in that place, can you bring other people into that place? And in that place, just that group, what can happen there? And this then, the conception metaphor. So now we're moving from the long-term arc at the species level, let's just look at the long-term arc at the individual level. The fertilized egg is fragile in the context of once it goes through its developmental arc, an extraordinarily resilient being. An adult human is kind of a kick-ass animal. Really, really good at being animal. But of course, the fertilized egg is still extremely fragile. So the question we might ask is like, well, what's our womb? Well, I'd actually push back on that. I'd say a fucking adult human is, is, a, is a weak, naked, hairless ape who gets his ass kicked by everybody, but with culture, with the instruction manual, he's badass. I actually disagree. I would uh, point out that the, the things that just basic humans can do, like throw shit accurately, are actually rather astounding in the context of the animal kingdom. And the plasticity of the design parameters of what the human body can actually be trained to do that is not coded in the instinct of a given animal is as impressive as the flexibility at the level of idea space. That there is no Brizhnikov in the animal kingdom. And to the degree that there is the Brizhnikov, that animal cannot also then become an Aretha Franklin. Like that's actually pretty fucking intense how much plasticity in design parameters in this particular physical body. Then of course you layer that, plug that actuation capacity, the plasticity of actuation capacity in with the plasticity of perception and ideation, obviously that thing has got, well, it gets you to the moon and back. But I think the, the, the proposition that I think you're hitting on, like the, the key question is, is recognizing that the definition or the necessary and sufficient conditions of coherence that I was describing is very much the adult form, the mature form. And so it is very much the case in my experience that coherence as it currently is able to manifest, ever, ever actually able to establish it, is extremely fragile and quite difficult to hold together even in just ordinary conditions, much less in quite challenging conditions. So the, the question of scaling it is a question actually of how do we simultaneously increase its, let's call it strength, its capacity to maintain coherence under a wide variety of different conditions, its scope, the degree to which it can actually bring in more people, and its depth, the degree to which it's actually able to fully realize the synergy value of those people, like instead of like a narrow band, broadband. So the question of how do we scale coherence, I think is all three of those simultaneously. Um, if you would, if you, if you don't mind, if we can go back to that notion of like the little things that seem to be, seem to be true. One of the other ones that I've found um, is that most of the failures that show up seem to actually fail for relatively simple reasons, having to do with. Um, either the particularities of how human development in the world delivers certain kinds of trauma, or the particularities of how the coming to being of homo sapiens deliver what you might call a species level trauma. Mm -hmm. right, so either people who are entering into coherence enter into relations of codependency, where you've talked about you know, the victim mindset and the savior mindset. Like these are all habitual responses that are either hard coded into homo hard-coded in, in what humanness is at the, at the more sort of uh, primal level. Or because we are human beings who universally have been developed in the context of society, we've developed an enormously large number of blind spots, bad habits, and traumas as a consequence of that. So sort of step one of these sort of you know, things that seem to work is you have to actually have gone through all the work of actually at the very least resolving yourself out of the trauma of society to the extent that, you know, to a pretty high extent, to be perfectly honest. Um, and then having a, a capacity of being conscious of how biological instincts and habits that are hardwired below the developmental level are going to show up.
in relationship. And so being able to go through that level of training. And there seems to be a kind of a minimum of those two that anyone has to be at some level of development along both of those uh, kinds of work to be able to enter into coherence at all. Yeah. And, and, and so, because now, now, now we're dealing, obviously, there are no folks comfortably camping out in happy game B land. And anybody who are going to be the trail breakers, pioneers, bridge builders, are going to have to be shedding game A conditioning and potentially accumulated traumas. And at least what I think, you know, we've had some of these conversations, the folks that are breaking trail, and even let's say the folks that are breaking trail and leading the way, and even fairly often bringing others into experiences of coherence, mm -hmm. are themselves subtly to significantly still traumatized, the wounded healers. For sure. Right? And so, um, and even in an instant specifically, we've even come across a community that's dedicated to working on all those traumas. In fact, there's, and there's quite a few. There's quite a few that are you know, engaging in their access point to communitas is through helping people better engage, experience catharsis. Right? And then you get this ecstatic moment of like, holy shit, right? we're healed, we're whole, we're connected, isn't this beautiful and amazing? And then it unspools mm. right there. And the question is like, well, wait, is it just we need to do more of the thing that these guys are already doing? They were partial or they weren't quite there yet. And right. do we get into some puritanical, increasingly high bar for who gets to play at the coherence game? Because, you know, you're bringing your dirty shoes into our pure petri dish like how do we actually help the transitional generations generations well i think yeah. you already said a key piece so one is humility humility the other is patience like one of the problems that tends to happen is there's a a real significant meaningful breakthrough which then takes itself as, ha as having been the breakthrough oh we did it awesome we're there right as opposed to a, okay, this is probably a three to five, maybe six generation process. So it's a more like this, this less like this movement and directionality with just an incomprehensible level of constantly going into humility and recognizing that no matter how much seems to have been done, we may only be 8% of the way there. And so that's a lot left. And, um, in some sense, that's that. But you can always get, you can get closer. And, and if, when you are closer, this is crucial, right? Being able to distinguish the difference between when you are more towards that and less, and then being able to notice that the choices that are coming from more towards that are the ones that should be leading your choice making. And the choices that are coming from less from that are the ones that should be trailing and fading. Right? So you actually become a vector. And so that and you become better and better at using that sense of more like this, less like this, in more and more of your choices, you actually begin to get a very nice progressive movement in that container of humility and patience. With enough runway and enough tolerance for creative destruction. Because you talked about... You, runway. Well, time. Because you, you talked about like, hey, humans are amazing, and check us out, we can figure out living in the Arctic and the deserts. Well, not really. You drop any single naked monkey in either of those places, they're dead in 72 oh, hours. But, okay. right, right, but, but enough close but no cigars and some lucky bastard finally figures it out and then that gets encoded in culture and then not everybody has to die and suddenly we're a desert tribe or mm -hmm. we're the Inuit. Absolutely. Right, so, so how do we do this if, right, there's both fragility and not indefinite time? I am reminded of the movie The Martian. What I notice is that there's a, uh, another trap, two traps, actually. One trap is the trap of urgency, and the other trap is the trap of like, perceived urgency. responsibility. When you say it's a trap of urgency, meaning the perception and then the acting as if, or do you mean the actual? The perception and the acting as if, which is in fact fully accurate. The fully accurate perception and the acting as if is a trap, right? It's the, it's the notion of, you know, James Bond defusing the bomb, the clock is ticking. He has to actually be acting as nonchalant as if he's in the process of you know, swirling his martini because even the least bit of feeling urgency 
guarantees failure. Yeah, it's the mountaineering go slow to go fast. Yeah. Right, exactly. So that's another key, right? And this happens all the time as you get it, and that, you can see it happen. I've seen that happen many times in myself, where there's a recognition of the urgency, which leads to a certain hardening and a certain willingness to explain moving into either things that are not yet actually possible in coherence or rationalizing pulling from the game a toolkit. Oh, that's a doozy. You're done. Okay. That speaks very much to what you were saying in terms of people falling out of their state. And we could talk about what does stage development take from state experience, but we could also talk about what are the sources of fragility. If we want to talk about anti-fragility, we should understand the sources of fragility and what we can do with those. And so some simple constructs. If we're endeavoring to create some kind of coherence, we could have that break down from internal forces or external forces or both, right? So external forces means rivalrous type dynamics, which is an in-group that is smaller than everything, given that it is still interacting with the rest of the world that it's embedded in. So I would say all in-groups that are smaller than everything have some inherent fragility of that kind. Then we can look at dynamics on the inside that could cause fragility and breakdown, which is actually going into rivalrous type dynamics with each other. Because the coherence that brings about the synergy, that brings about the emergent capacities that actually get selected for happens because of a kind of relating that is anti-rivalrous. That allows a very deep uh, type of synergy to occur. I'd like to have a proposed a meta and a meta meta move. Okay. The meta move. Wasn't this already meta enough? I'm noticing that the conversation has a particular topology to it. I'm curious why that's the case. So it's meta because I presume that the answer to that curiosity will have something to do with either homos, we are in fact primates, or something about our developmental environment that has caused this topology to, to spontaneously emerge, which is to say that the conversation is a V. Daniel's talking to you, I'm talking to you, Daniel and I are not talking to each other, and there is no third. Right? The third maybe like something else. Right there, yeah. So that's one. That's the meta move. Why? Why, is, why did that topology settle in the way that it settled in? Then the, the meta meta move, eh, unfortunately, oh, the meta meta move is, of course, in the act of actually contemplating the meta, we can, in fact, endeavor to be doing it rather than talking about it. And we can notice how the doing it informs the talking about it in a fashion that resolves the question. And in addition to the three of us and whatever the uh, container or emergent is, this is also on film, and there's the consciousness of the people who are watching it, which I'm also sensing into and wanting to um, make sure that this is hopefully useful for. So that's <laughs> included in the consideration. Something between comprehensible and or uh, interesting. So there's a third to the nth. I mean, I, I, I would, at least I feel like there was, there have been moments, little blips where there's been, at least for me, new or interesting perspectives and, and ahas and insights. And I don't know whether that's things I just haven't heard you guys say before or whether those are actually, you know, emergent, but, um, Yes, what I'm noticing is that I'm noticing a feeling of there not being something coming from Daniel that actually creates the right kind of symmetry in the conversation. So I'm interested in getting your perspective in a fashion that is not responsive, but is in fact direct, like coming from the inside out. The thing that I was um, feeling to share, I just didn't hear a spot where it was in that it was relevant actually uh, very much connects to the conversation that the two of you were having but it was what I was thinking about anyways which is this relationship between the subordination of the individual for the collective and the sovereignty of the individual like fractal sovereignty and 
I was thinking about the body as an analogy of it's such a fascinating thing where all of the cells are autonomous agents governed by their own internal genetic code. They could grow in a petri dish for some period of time, but they're operating in a way that is both in their own good interest and in the interest of the other cells around them and the entire body simultaneously. So there isn't a theory of trade-offs of what is good for them is damaging other or they're sacrificing themselves for other. And that's true at the level of cell to cell, but it's also true at the level of organ to organ and organ system to organ system and cell to organ. So at vertical levels and horizontal levels, there's this kind of just radical anti-rivalrous synergy of sovereign things, of things that have their own self-organizing boundary, the fascia of the organ, the cell membrane. And we're talking about that at the next level of organism to organism. And we've done that up to tribe, and now we're talking about beyond tribal scale, but that, that kind of process. And I'm thinking about cancer in the body, because a cancer cell uh, starts doing what seems to be in the short term better for it, it actually replicates, it consumes and replicates faster, but it breaks down the coherence of the whole. And in the process, it ends up killing itself, killing its progeny, right? It suicides because it debases the substrate that it depends upon in kind of a short-term, small-minded focus. And so there's this idea, like, with regard to, like, there's an interesting feeling, even of that way of speaking of it as subordinate the individual and I, I was just thinking of Einstein's quote that it's an optical delusion of consciousness to think there are separate things when in fact there is one integrated reality that we call universe. And so like we can actually rationally get that. And something I think about all the time is, okay, I can think about myself as a separate thing, but what am I without the atmosphere? I, I don't even exist. What am I without the plants that generate the atmosphere? I don't even exist. What am I without the electromagnetic field, without the earth, without gravity, without the other people that made the things that I use and the concepts that I use? So when I get that I'm an emergent property of the whole that has uniqueness and individuality, but is not separable from, that the distinctness doesn't mean separability, then I have both distinct and inseparable simultaneously. So I have interconnected with the whole and having a unique role to play. And so the dialectic there is something that increases actually the distinction and the uniqueness and increases the synergy and interconnectivity simultaneously. Yeah. And the first part is to just recognize if I'm doing the cancer thing, it will end up being bad for what I care about too, even if in the short term it seems like a good thing. And I think that's the thing with rivalrous game theory, that we're at the place where we realize exponentially larger extraction and pollution and war and information war is existential now. So we can't even rationalize that we can keep doing it that way. I'm noticing as you're saying that I'm trying to get to the feeling of it, which is by the way quite hard, but um, one of the places I landed was that, you know, we still have that nice example of the jazz band, fortunately. We actually have concrete examples of what these things are like to be in. And I'm noticing that as a player in the jazz band, that feeling of not being subordinated to the whole, but actually somehow being supported and achieving a higher level of individuation is felt. So the question, of course, what does that feel like? It's interesting to notice that while some people, not many, I think, try to think about that strategically, like, okay, how do I make sure that I am, in fact, protected? Most people are, in fact, proceeding by do I actually feel like I am increasing my autonomy? Do I feel more agentic and more autonomous and more able to express my essence or selfness into the world? So I'm interested, like, what does that feel like to actually move into that place? And if we could do it, like, what would it actually have felt like for the single cell going into the multi-cell? Because like, there's something about the quality of that that we can actually grasp at that level. You've done it many times, in many different modes. Like you've done it when you've gone like creating a teams doing athletic activities together. So they, they flow into something, but where the place where each individual begins to drop into a space where they are 
at their peak as an individual. So, yeah, I mean, that feels like something, you know, straightforwardly obvious shit, which is basically my core needs are met and I'm seen in my worldview and everything and, and, and my needs are validated such that I can then drop them in order to play, you know, going from my fi finite game of separate self into a more infinite game of emergence. And it feels like there also needs to be a, a tolerance for ambiguity and a willingness to get messy. So back to the jazz guys, I mean, consistently the most righteous jams come out of kind of going in down into the mud as a band, you know, someone's off noodling, exploring a theme or, you know, and it's not actually danceable. It's not anything. And it's even to the point of just unspooling entirely. And then some quicksilver starlight comes out of that, you know, and then it all gels. And it's that patience to your point about timing, Jordan, you know, it's the patience to let it all come undone in order to come back together in some new emergent form that seems almost essential. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't know, like when you were described, because I, I mean, as soon as you described organisms, organs, and all that, I was like, oh yeah, okay. So social media, digital narcissism, fucking scraping everybody else's jam, biting people's rhymes, poaching people's dharma, feels like the cancerous yep. um, impulse that we're experiencing right now. And when we come, when we glimpse this emergence, or, or of, of coherence, it's sort of like, oh, your, you know, your life's work and special, like the thing you're uniquely designed to do, you know, what in a traditional sense might be called Dharma, you know, fits perfectly with the thing I'm uniquely here to do. And holy shit, I was carrying this thing. It was lonely, it was hard, it was scary, it was heavy. But now I think that actually these pieces lay down beside each other. And now we're actually beginning to see a picture that none of us held and none of us could see. And that to me is like, I think how this happens. Right. But on the other hand, we're also having people be like, hmm, that's a pretty damn picture. Let me just scribble it and snap a selfie and fucking post it. Well, there's an interesting thing that happens here, right? So as an individual, if particularly in this social environment, if you take responsibility in yourself, hmm, let me say this right, okay. So the human instrument, I think, has a really fine-tuned ability to discern the distinction between those two things. So you can tell when somebody's faking it in a deep way. Like something in your gut is telling you something's off. They're not connected. They're not expressing something that's coming from their heart. All right? They're playing somebody else's jam or whatever the phrase is that you use. <laughs> if you don't, when that happens, if you give that attention, if you give it energy, you are fucking up with everything. It is crucial as an individual that on the one hand, when somebody is actually out on the tightrope in the middle of trying to figure out how to express something from the heart that is very difficult that you actually call it oh, that's gold well done awesome and on the other hand when you feel it that no there's something off about that this guy here is faking it that you also express that clearly and so the what happens is you get a very interesting set of feedback loops to the degree to which everybody's playing the game of both participant and curator with authenticity and skillfulness, you actually start getting positive feedback loops that move into a space of increasingly anti-fragile power. But if there's defection, and by defection here I mean things like laziness or um, bad habit, or of course obviously just old faction defection, like, oh, I'm gonna steal that and run with it, then it, it doesn't come together. So, but this is, this, this is nice, right? this is fine. Like to the degree to which, Jamie, you show up consistently every single time willing to put it on the line and calling what is true true and calling what is false false then and I meet you there trying to do the same thing what ends up happening is that we actually build a relationship that has resilience to it there's strength to it and there's strength to it both in the sense that we can have confidence in it and in the sense that it can do more than a relationship that doesn't have that in it so there is actually a natural like orientation towards strength that does show up there, but it is also based on skillfulness. And discernment. Right? Discernment at the bottom. To be a consumer and a curator, because otherwise you got the difference between Burning Man and Fire Festival. Yeah. Well, this is, goes back to that problem of, of society. And so much of discernment is just like, almost the first thing that is beaten out is discernment. And so being able to come back and do things like, 
recognize that the whole thing here is part of discernment and being able to listen and say, okay, my heart aches when somebody says something. All right, well, that's probably real, deep, important, true. Learn how to listen to it. Learn how to speak what it means with clarity. So this is like in that minimum ingredient. Discernment is a minimum ingredient. And in short supply these days. And in short supply. But everyone everywhere can actually improve the discernment where they are and it will always make their life better. So it's an easy thing to say. Increase your discernment. It's never a bad idea. To your earlier call, there's actually something that I feel to add the conversation that hasn't been spoke to yet. But I actually was feeling into and wanted to speak to the kind of topology you were noticing because there's a something that I noticed about it that I think is actually really nice. So we could ask, is it because Jamie is sitting in the corner and it's literally just the physicality of it? There's probably a number of factors. But it makes heaps of sense that you and I have actually got to have more conversations on these topics more recently than we have. There's kind of an assumed yeah. knowing we didn't all get to jam before on this or prepare this. This is real-time extemporaneous. And I don't know if you've ever even expressed Rule Omega to Jamie, but he's just doing it. Yeah. And he's kind of openly inquiring into the questions that are really alive, and it's a little bit easier for us to riff off what each other is saying because we've got some recently shared language on these things. and But the Rule Omega is actually a really simple practical thing that I, towards coherence, that I would like everybody here to get is if, if Jordan and I are talking, or if you and I are talking, like we, we have this, and I think we naturally have it, but it's worth making explicit, is if you say something that sounds ridiculous to me, or batshit crazy or wrong, I actually give the benefit of the doubt that you might have a reason that I didn't understand first. So rather than just default into you're probably wrong, I'll ask more questions. Mm -hmm. and, and that giving the benefit of the doubt that you actually might have something useful to say mm -hmm. increases my making sure that I understand you before I'm responding. And that actually, and the disagreeing with something that you weren't even saying because I didn't seek to understand well enough creates very turbulent flow rather than laminar flow breaks down coherence, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. If people could just do that yeah. towards coherence, if they could just give the benefit of the doubt that each other, that everyone has some signal, yeah. even if it's on a very different part of reality than the part they're focused on, and even if there's noise mm -hmm. involved, and they're listening for the signal first, right. that would change everything. That's a it. starting place. So Daniel expresses something, and let's say he's trying to express something that's hard, which by the way, the rule make is designed for that kind of a thing. I'm not interested in having conversations that aren't actually trying to break new ground. So, okay, do it, dude. So he expresses something hard. And in the expression, 98% is noise and 2% is signal. Like the jazz riff. But what happens is, is that my job is to actually do two things. One, hold all of it. Not just say, fuck it, that, was, that wasn't 100% right, so I'm just going to nuke it. Hold all of it. Then, in myself, discernment, to what degree can I express something back that gets rid of the 50% 50, 50 that is noise. So now I've got 6% signal. Express it back. And of course, if he can then do that, and now you, three is even better, a more profound instrument, because you're going to be bringing a different perspective. Perhaps you can take it and actually zoom in on it down to the point where we're actually 50% signal. That's the idea. Right? And so one, it's an invitation to say, hey, we're trying to do something that's hard. Let's all try to do something that's hard and be willing to take the risk of not speaking elegantly and on the premise that everyone else is doing their absolute fucking level best to hear that which is trying to speak itself through you and listening into themselves like, oh, there it is, tone, got it. There's something beautiful and clear there. Here's what I heard. And that's real omega. And there's a psychological safety that's created to be able to try out new stuff, knowing that we know we're trying out new stuff and we're giving the benefit of the doubt. So it, it actually does become more explorative and that's where you get more novelty. <laughs> and then I imagine, actually I don't know if this is true for Daniel, I imagine it's true for you, but certainly if it's true for me, is that I'm also noticing in myself like this constant, you know, when you're meditating you feel this 
this constant chatter and flow of like all the things that are going on internally that are either like certain ideas are popping up or emotional responses. Some of them are like social emotional responses. Some of them are like, just like I got to pee and like being able to actually notice all that chatter internally and do the discernment interior and say, okay, but all that chatter, what's that? What if that's actually a signal? Oh shit. But listen to all of it. You have to have, you have, we're going to make it goes in and out, right? I'm listening to myself fully and I'm listening to the, to the others fully and trying to use discernment to continuously allow that process to turn lead into gold. Now there's a really important distinction that we're saying something that is different than the way that some people think about multi-perspectivism, which is we're not saying, I'm not saying, all perspectives are equally valid. And I'm also not saying that there is no way to integrate them into higher order understanding. I'm saying all perspectives have some signal. Mm -hmm. Generally have some noise. <laughs> and that perspective is itself a reduction of information on the reality being perceived. Mm. And that's from the, actually... From the quantum foam of it all. From just the definition actually of observer, observing, observed, I can't uh, take myself out of reality to observe it in a unitary way. And if I'm observing you now versus in a different state, I'm going to observe different things, right? Someone else at a different time. If I'm observing the west side of the house versus the east side of the house versus the aerial view versus inside the house, they all give me some signal, some truth about the nature of the house. None of them give me the whole truth of the nature of the house because it's a 3D object with interiority and depth, and I can't collapse it perfectly into a 2D picture, mm. right? So perspective itself is a reduction on information complexity. So the first part, I give rule omega to myself that my perspective has some signal, but I'm also positive it's incomplete. And thinking that my perspective, knowing that there's truth in it, it's easy to think it's the truth, or it's true with a capital T. And that's like an immaturity we have to get over. There's some truth, and I'm positive it's incomplete. And I think there's a pretty good chance if you've been perceiving the situation, you might have some additional truth that I actually really want. Which means truth is transperspectival. And Jordan was saying earlier, also transparadigmatic, meaning I have to take multiple perspectives through multiple types of interpretation. That was at the beginning saying like, the words aren't going to quite get it, so we're going to have to come at it from different perspectives because the words are also in a, a reduction on the information complexity of the thing. This is also a big part of that, what happens in the post, well, I have, it's pre-trans, you know, why is this not a Quaker meeting? The Quakers are doing something awesome, but they're running one paradigm. What you have to actually say is, okay, let's run, well, let's, at the very minimum, let's run both the Lakota and the Quaker paradigms while we're at it. I'm usually running, I don't know, 70 or 90 distinct paradigms simultaneously all the time. And there's many. And, I, and the idea is not to try to collapse them down to a single master paradigm, but actually to allow each one of them to have the particular piece that they're holding, just like eyes and ears. Say, okay, cool, this paradigm is able to grasp things in a certain way, this one doesn't, that's neat. Recognizing always that you're never going to be able to perceive reality, but that by virtue of getting more and more dimensions of parallax, you can actually have more possibility of having some insight. And it's the insight that's the key, not the sense. So you're actually going from sense making into insight, which is very different. Mm -hmm. Meaning just sort of outside in, inside out? Yeah, right, that you're trying to actually build a, a capacity to be someone who does rather than a knowledge you don't, want to under, you don't want to know what's happening. You want to be able to respond to what's happening. So it's, you, know, you become a musician by virtue of having a skillful portfolio of sensitive qualities in self and then a skillful mapping of that into expression. You don't become a musician by being very good at reading somebody else's music. So there's something... I the thing that I was actually saying that I wanted to add to the conversation has to do with the rivalrous nature of ego. So like when you talk about cut falling out of it, the fact that we exist within a macro economy where we have private balance sheets 
and our balance sheets are rivalrous, meaning I can advance mine by ripping your stuff off and vice versa. We, ha we have structural bases for rivalry because they evolved in a rivalrous context. So we have to change that. So there's like not just a new sense-making and culture and experience, but also new infrastructure and new social structures, probably beyond the scope of what we'll get to today. But even if we take the balance sheet away, there's the like, is someone wanting to take up more space in the jam session because of unmet identity needs? Yeah. And do they actually care about the felt experience of somebody else who's seeking yeah. to express something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And do we actually feel, do we actually feel each other? And are we coming from enough wholeness that I'm not relating out of need most of the time? Yeah, yeah. and musicians call that cutting, right? Like if, like if somebody deliberately outplays the other person, yeah. And leaves the and leaves their contribution diminished, versus accretive. Yeah. Right. Those are cutting sessions, and that's it's bad form. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, so I'm noticing now, if we switch this domain, I'm thinking about the folks on the other side of the camera. So let's take this and make this practical in the context of sense making in the world that we live in right now. Um, almost everything that we're talking about, if you apply it, one of the things that you notice, of course, is that all the stuff that typically goes under the heading of sense making is worse than useless. So any newspaper, any news program, pretty much every scientific paper, to be perfectly frank, you know, we've done that analysis and taken a look at how few of them are replicable and how much of an incentive structure there is for actually lying to be able to generate local selective advantage. Um, at least misinterpreting. At least misinterpreting, yeah, sure. or overstating or whatever. P it's, yeah, it's a mess. Um, so game A, as a sense-making architecture, broadly speaking, waste of time. Well, that opens up some very interesting challenges. Right? And this goes back to the notion of game B being immature, infantile, no, zygotic. <laughs> but where we are now, I would say, is holding yourself a, a feeling of care for everything, and then truly act and make sense in the direction of your actual responsibility, which I believe has been said more elegantly as, what is it, think globally, act locally? Just take that seriously. Like the reality is, is that everybody's got plenty of work to do at home. And what we're trying, or at least what I'm saying, what I'm, what I'm articulating is that to do this thing, to come into coherence, to play game B, there's a lot of work that has to be done in the individual, in yourself. And then the way to learn how to do coherence is always going to be with people with whom you actually have real relationships. And not us, not the three of us. Your wife, your husband, your kids, your parents, or at least other human bodies with whom you can actually be in real physical proximity meaning for a meaningful amount of time. And so that's, that's definitely going to be the fabric out of which this thing gets woven. It takes time, for sure. And it takes um, doing the hard human stuff so you actually have an embodied experience of what it feels like to actually do the hard human stuff as opposed to book learning on that direction. And good instincts and good habits built through long practice. And the notion is to say, okay, let's connect the dots. The proposition is, if you want to actually resolve problems around immigration in Italy, honestly, not to make yourself feel good, or to look good to other people, but for real, then the path to get there is this path that starts here in yourself and moves out in spirals through things that you can actually touch and truly take responsibility for. And then always showing up from that center of sovereignty. Mm -hmm. So that feels like Hero's Journey 101 or Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz, right? Well, you're saying, hey, the way forward into game B and emergent coherence is to actually come all the way back home to the basics of good old fashioned humanity. But in order for me to be able to reanimate and fully live into the basics of good old fashioned humanity, I actually have to have gone on some initiatory transformative journey in order to remember, in fact, that fucking cow town in Kansas is the best place ever, and there's no place like home. Nice, so you just join, I get it. So by adding those two together, it comes clear. Beautiful. 
Yeah, yeah, that's very nice. It's very, it's actually odd how simple and uh, like plain things are. And of course, it's, what's interesting is that once you grasp that, once it lands, you begin to see how the the bigger challenges begin to self-resolve. Mm -hmm. There was a point you made that wasn't the main point. It was a tangent, but I think it's super critical, so I want to um, emphasize it, which is, okay, so why can't we trust any of the things that normally look like sense-making? Well, there's a bunch of reasons, but basically we learn how to do signaling for intentional game theoretic purposes. And so rather than just share signal that is true and representative, we share signal that will advantage some rivalrous agenda. So most signal ends up being that. And one of the things that you were just saying is, uh, or consequence of it is that there's an ethic to not fuck up the information ecology. Mm -hmm. Right? Like in the same way that we say don't pollute, and most people get, are pretty comfortable with don't throw your cigarette butt on the ground. Don't actually disinform anybody else for your own getting ahead or withhold information where you can avoid doing so because you're actually disempowering the sense making of others in the process and to really be tuned into is the as I'm seeking to make sense I want to increase other people's sovereignty and their capacity to make sense so I want to increase the intactness of the information ecology they're exposed to rather than decrease it right. up to but not beyond the point of Bostrom and those guys Info hazards. Yeah. Well, <laughs> to the degree that someone else has clearly rivalrous agenda with regard to information, then you have to factor that insofar as sharing information with them would then decrease sovereignty for lots of people. But glue together what Daniel said and what you just added to it, what I was saying. To the degree to which I'm playing this game with complete strangers out in info space who I'll never meet. I'm probably going to lose. I don't know how much, how much info, info... Playing which game? The game of Rulo Omega. The game of information ecology. Because multipolar trap, someone's going to be a dick. Two degrees from playing with my wife, yeah. I'm probably going to have a better life. Yeah. All right, so that's the idea. Now, the idea is, if you're playing it trying to say, okay, hold on, I'm trying to solve the game theoretic problem with complete strangers by telling the truth, anybody who understands how to do game theory is going to say, oh, you're, you're the one who's actually the dupe. Ah, uh, we found this up. Don't be Ned Stark. Don't be Ned Stark. Unless you're actually in Winterfell with your family. Then be Ned Stark. That's the idea, right? Don't, the key is don't go to King's Landing. Yeah. Full stop. That's the key. Listen, so to your point, though, if you're saying, hey, um, yeah, you know, honor information ecology for the enhanced sense-making of all, minus the folks who will do the multipolar polar trap grab the ring, capture the flag, but in a, rain, in a realm of infinitely distributable digital information, aren't we always simultaneously playing both of those games at once without even clear understanding of the which and the when and the who? That's when this thing has got to go away. Yep. Unfortunately, this sort of the, remember I said the inverse is in the current sense-making environment, I have an expectation that I should simultaneously be aware of everything that's going on in the world and a sense of my having responsibility for it. You just pointed out the media infrastructure that supports that possibility has a catastrophic collapse around it. So bizarrely enough, the only way to have a prophylactic sense against that catastrophic collapse, which we can double click on if that's not clear what I mean by that, um, is to only have your media infrastructure be driven by direct real relationships. So begin with real relationships and proceed from there. Yeah. Lots of problems with broadcast, but the ability to amplify dangerous and wrong memes and to be able to share without context and without relationship and without connection and without relevancy and without being able to speak into the capacity for listening. Mm -hmm. And if you just come back to the body for an analogy, cells go cancerous. The body's dealing with them all the time, right? You only, you only get cancer if the body can't deal with it. But imagine if a single cell had the ability to broadcast its message to every other cell simultaneously, and it didn't have to go through propagation, through the cells surrounding it and those types of things. Like, we'd be fucked instantly. Um, we, the kind of key thing that's helpful is that each cell is being modulated by the cells near it to 
come back into check. And so there's error correction processes. Okay. So let's unpack that because so for sure you said, Hey, think globally, act locally, but that shit doesn't scale fast at all. You talk about developmental processes, patience, that stuff doesn't meet timelines. And then we, we discuss the notion of um, the moment you go to some form of politics of suspicion, effectively, right? And, and the idea that there's esoteric, exoteric, you know, the secret within inner sanctums, outer sanctums, those kind of things. Um, I think that's clearly worked in the past for any, you know, ultimately infinitely potent lineage traditions and the kind of those sort of things. There's, there, were, there were filters and gates of who had access to the information in our unique contemporary situation. Um, take an example like Sasha Shulgin, right? So the chemist who, um, you know, repopularized MDMA, created a lot of, you know, designer molecules, compounds and psychedelics, and then was collaborating with the DEA and then when the DEA looked like they were going to be shutting down and repressing that information, published his two cookbooks where he open sourced. Mm -hmm. right? So this is basically about open sourcing versus closed source. Um, and he open sourced all that information. Now, net positive on the world, I mean, if we use him as an example, if he went the open source route. Now, you also ended up with street corner chemists being able to do things they never would have been able to do without his two books published. You also ended up with the advent and rise of and popular promulgation of psychedelic therapies. Did Sasha do the right thing? Should that have been kept and cloistered? Um, and how does the notion of, because I mean the thesis of stealing fire was the only shot we've got to avoid weaponization, commodification, or collapse into hedonism and particularly the first two are just better funded, better focused, they're gonna beat our asses every time, is to open source reliable techniques of self-initiation, effectively, right? And ideally in service of coherence, faster than efforts to capture it. And I don't know whether that's true, and I don't even know whether that's wise, but that was the best fucking idea I had at the time. So like, what do we think about that? Because you could say, just dump it all out there, mm -hmm. publish it, let the chips fall and hope that the Rebel Alliance, right, somehow hangs on to the plans for the Death Star ahead of the, uh -huh. instead of the Empire building an even better Death Star. What I was thinking as you were saying that was, uh, we'll actually use that metaphor. Um, a lot of stuff was going through me as you, were, as you were talking, and one of the things that came to me was, I feel reasonably confident that, that there are in fact things that are appropriate to being open sourced. We actually mentioned one earlier, discernment. So discernment is the sort of thing that is somehow not just uncapturable, it's anti-capturable. So to the degree to which somebody actually goes through the process of building their discernment, they are in fact more likely to become an ally than they would otherwise have been, for example. And so the Rebel Alliance shouldn't be building or outsourcing or open sourcing plans on building Death Stars they should be building in open sourcing plans on how to build a rebel alliance. So that if the empire... Well, what about lightsabers? Hold on. It's just, so if the empire gets a hold of the plans, all that happens is the empire becomes more rebel alliance and less empire. So not lightsabers. Not lightsabers. This, this is actually a really tricky topic. Um, one relevant concept is the concept of safe to fail probes. And so when you were mentioning earlier that the people who went into the Arctic, like probably most of them failed. Mm -hmm. And then some small set figured out how to make it and then those are the ones that figured it out, right? Mm -hmm. So, and the same with the jazz riff where it's mostly gibberish, mm -hmm. but some beautiful thing comes. Evolution has a very high fail rate, but it's exploring a wide search space and then the things that make it through are awesome, right? Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things you're asking about timing is can we do an evolutionary process factoring the time that we have and can we keep allowing failure with exponential failure possibilities yeah. and yeah. so the CDC open sourcing everything that it knows about bioweapons would be stupid um, because on one hand you could say well it's cool that they're open sourcing the knowledge so more people can work on protecting against it except you actually have more capacity for that knowledge to be harmful mm -hmm. than to be beneficial yeah. and with bioweapons or with anything that can be weaponized at that scope with AI, with nanotech, with you really have different considerations 
because you can't really control safe to fail probes. And say, so say that again, like just, just phrase that a different way. If the worst thing that can happen is your jam isn't that good, mm -hmm. like that's not that bad. Mm -hmm. It's a bummer and you, the next night you have a better jam. If the worst thing that happens is you release a auto poetic pattern replicator that kills all life, you can't fuck around with like playing with that thing. Mm -hmm. And so you, you actually have to be much more careful that if anyone is exploring how to create um, anti-fragility to that knowledge, that should be held carefully. Okay, great. So, let, so how do we say, hey, let's just imagine that we have, with a little bit of thinking, let's say we could woodshed and you could fund, you know, whatever, 24 rad and MacArthur level super smart folks to come together and come up with protocols for group coherence that work more often than not. Do we open source that or are we more concerned that it can also build the Borg? Well, if I double click on the content of that, the answer is that it, we open source that, but that's because there's no such thing. <laughs> Underneath it, there's no such thing which as protocols for group coherence. There's more along the lines of, remember it's, we're trying to cultivate insight, not teach. So it's, there's a way to generate a, in individual humans, the, ins, the embodied insight to be able to, in themselves, build a capacity to come into coherence that then does actually come into coherence. So if you were to be able to, so again, discernment is, is the canonical point. Open source discernment, great. Open source practices and techniques that work in the directionality of improving discernment at the individual level. Um, but I want to go back to something you said earlier because I think it, this ends up being quite key. Um, you mentioned something that, about the, like, the path of relationality doesn't scale. But we're, we're all familiar with the notion of how a super saturated solution does a phase transition to crystallization. Yeah. That I think is the answer. If you actually do this thing where what your, your field effect, which is to say your open source broadcast, is bringing more and more people into a poised state where their ability to move into coherence is becoming easier and easier and easier, then what ends up happening is that a small amount that actually does drop into coherence creates a crystallization phase transition that could actually scale extremely rapidly. And has the characteristic of being very strong and very precise because it's starting on a basis that has no compromise. Yeah, I mean, my, 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 I think we're actually, I mean, it depends on how we're defining coherence and what you're, what you're perceiving as initial conditions. Um, and, and your question about states and stages, basically. Because it feels like you're emphasizing a stage-based argument, which is that it's slow, it's hard work, and you have to really grow and develop into the person that can stably hold coherence. And I think what I, if I notice what I'm tracking, I'm like, yeah, absolutely. That's the foundational level, the springboard from which you leap. Um, and obviously the higher that is, the less hops you gotta have, right, to get to the level of coherence. Um, and between, you know, smart tech, um, pharmaceuticals, um, you know, lineage practices, like there's enough out there these days that you can for sure create at least, you know, like the vomit comet, you can create moments where everybody is weightless. You can create a, a transient group coherence that, and there's, it's a bell curve distribution from what, what I can tell, 10% of the people lose their shit don't know what to do with that space or, you know, maybe it's like 10, it could be more, but let's just say tails. You got, you got the people who can't hang and lose their shit. And then you got the people, it doesn't budge at all. And those are the psychopaths and they should not have been exposed to this. And then there's the bell curve in the middle who are like, oh, wow. You know, the Omega principle, like, oh, wow, I'm an organism. I'm an ear. I'm an eye. Holy shit. We're seeing in parallax. This is, joyful, wondrous, amazing, and transformative. And so what do we do with that? I'd, I'd like to enter 
on a topic we haven't talked about yet, which is the what trust is to coherence. Uh, it was mentioned earlier, not defecting. And so one model that I just use personally for trust is I trust people as much as I trust them in their worst states. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because if there's a bell curve distribution on the states of behavior they're going to go into, maybe, which is, for most people, pretty coupled to their emotional states, unfortunately. Right? I want to uncouple those so that even if someone's in a shitty emotional state, they don't behave shittily. That they can witness it and not act on it, right? Like, um, I'm in the fetal position right now, not smashing and crashing things. Right. And then I want to help what makes them go into the shittiest emotional states, which is trauma and meaning-making patterns, I want to help heal that, right? So they don't go into as shitty states as often, but then also decouple their internal state from their behavior. But if, if someone m sometimes takes information I share with them and uses it in really synergistic ways, and generally it is at least discerning, but when they're pissed off, uses it as a weapon against me, th but that happens, well, I can't share certain things with them, right? So there is raising the floor of the shittiest behavior you allow of yourself in relationship that makes you more trustworthy, that is actually really at the heart of our ability to have anti-fragile coherence. It says, you know what, no matter how upset with you I am, there are certain fucked up things I'm just never gonna do as my own standard for myself. And then part of our discernment is to also be able to pay attention to where someone is, not just in their highest states after the state induction methods you're talking about, but where they are in the shitty parts. And one of the things I'm really interested in is not just making people's highest states higher. Well, what brings them into their shittiest states is still anchored, and now they, they actually have a wider space to reconcile, and they can even get bipolar about it. It happens a lot. Yeah. I want to help clean this stuff up. For sure. Cool. So let's yeah, yeah. on that. And, and, and it's recursive. I was yeah. landing there as well. I was thinking, okay, so state and stage. Um, obviously... For me, the first thing that comes up in terms of state is there's the constant recurrence of the trap of taking the state for the stage. All right, so let's carefully partition them and say, okay, they're not. And to the degree to which you've gone to Burning Man and take, taken drugs, you are not, in fact, actually else, anywhere. But maybe you saw a glimpse that there is somewhere else to go. That's neat. So very carefully. So the first is big red flag, state is not stage. State is not going to get you to stage by itself. Take it slow. Okay, so then what happens in state? And as I was kind of just, again, some first-person experience, well, a lot of the stuff that we were talking about in terms of what a given individual has to actually be able to come into to be able to start participating in a direct collaboration and getting to stage, in my experience, actually happened in states, right? You want to tra heal trauma. Trauma healing can happen very well with, say, psychedelics. Transparatomatic mind, really, really effectively supported by certain kinds of ecstatic states. Um, so there's a lot of things I think, I think if you actually take the state and think of it as an instrument that can be pointed at particular capacities that can be moved into stage because or through the use of that. So how do I use a particular state experience to actually developmentally level up a stage in my personal development and just have iterations there, then I think we're good. Then I think it works very nicely. But we, we know where the center is. The center is here. We want to develop mature human beings. And there are many, many different state experiences that are part of the process of doing that, many of which we have to use now because our developmental environment has so fucked us up that we're going to have to use some pretty interesting tools to break stuff out. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that would be my sense as well. It's just that they, they are, it is a beautiful thing that a peak state that creates safety, security, connection, insight, belonging can lend itself very strongly to, to be the fuel source for deep, I mean, we see this with MDMA, PTSD therapy, and a bunch of other things, but basically allows you to go back and reformat and reintegrate places that are currently wounded or traumatized, and that we do that in relationship with others, mm -hmm. um, tightens trust, tightens bonds, and then further creates the capacity for us to learn to play well with each other through all of those stages, which, you mm -hmm. know, so if, so if we can learn to share states well with each other and experience momentary 
coherence, momentary transpersonal sense making, and be in, in the in the mud with each other, supporting each other. You know that is the, the the linkage between those two is the communitas is like, you know, for me it feels like there's, you know, nothing new under the sun kind of shit. But like if you think of like gospel churches, you know, coming out of the African American slave experience, like there's that sense of they are perfectly designed, um, you know, vehicles for a lot of this, which is yeah. you, you sway. In fact, have you guys seen the the trailer for the new Aretha Franklin? Amazing Grace. Mm. So it's like this. She did this ripping album called Amazing Grace in a Watts gospel church in like 1974, and then all the footage was lost. And it's just come out. Like I, I literally wept seeing this this fucking trailer. It was unreal. And she starts singing the song Amazing Grace, and she just takes that A and she just does it. She goes all over. The, she's like 29 years old at the time. And but the but the gospel choir who's backing her up are like giving it up like they're feeling the shimmy shakes they're feeling the juice they're giving it up for it and then they start praising and testifying and like the whole thing just goes through the roof and you're like oh my god and then there's the swaying the clapping the dancing the moving and you're like it is weeping for the humanity of our wounding it is praising you know the divinity of our possibility and it's connecting like literally like church as a verb and you're like, ah, oh, shit, man, we got it. We just, you know, we just need to dust that shit off and like create new versions. When you when you when you imagine the gospel church, one of the things that makes it so powerful is that you're also noticing it is in continuity with a bigger context. It's actually part of a real community, yep. right? And so yep. it's not like you teleport to the gospel church and then you all fly back to your different cities. Yeah. You walk out and then you go live with each other, yeah. and it contains the whole of humanity. It's got little kids and grandmas, it's got grandpas, it's got the whole human family in a single place. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like a, a heuristic. If your state experience is you and a bunch of other 20-something rich white people, it's probably not right. Something's probably off about that. There's something going to be missing. If it, if it contains the whole of humanity, yep. heuristic, right? Not ideology, heuristic. This, you know, it's a, Multi-generational, children, adults out there. And, you know, across different, a whole community. If it's continuity, if... if the group is spontaneously getting together in Bali, and then everybody's flying back to their West Coast, East Coast flyover cities. Again, probably not going to get the thing done. If, on the other hand, you're already living in community and the state experience is supporting a deeper communitas that is lived 24-7, okay, that's more likely to work. So it sounds like you're adding state, stage, and place. Enduring. Enduring. Continuity. Wholeness. Right? Think, of it, think of it as part of a, a whole continuous process. And then, of course, what happens is you get all kinds of interesting stuff because now, you know, one of the things, as you're, as particularly as you were talking, I was like feeling this really interesting thing, like, okay, what are the failure conditions in the efforts to go here? Again, like, where does it fail? And one of the ones that was really interesting is like the difference between, I'm going to call it like gluing together analytics and true synthesis. So gluing together analytics is this thing where like, okay, I've got one piece, transparent mind, Got another piece is that I've worked really, really good in my yoga practice to be able to feel peaceful. Uh, I got another piece where I've taken a whole lot of drugs together with a bunch of people so we really feel close and we work some stuff out over, over ayahuasca. And then what I'm going to do is kind of like put these in the same space and pretend that by sticking them together really hard, I've actually achieved some new synthesis. Right? In fact, what I have is I have three distinct things that aren't actually, actually integrated. So it's the difference between a puzzle and a photograph or even a puzzle and a real piece of reality. And I think we're into this a lot. It's almost like the, uh, the group equivalent of spiritual bypass, which is that we can arbitrarily generate a simulation of each of the artifacts of coherence. And we can do so so consistently and so effectively that we really do think we've actually achieved coherence. Like, do you feel it? Yeah, I feel it. Neat. Do you have transparent magnetic mind? Got it, no problem. Like every piece, every piece that you can identify, you can show. And yet it's not the whole thing because it's actually not integrated into a continuous wholeness. So that, I think, is something to be very careful about, is that you can't stitch it together. It actually is coming from the direction of, is this actually part of an integrated wholeness with these heuristics? You know, do I notice that there's a whole of the human family, a whole human tribe, a community, a real community? Is the state experience connected on both sides with livingness? That kind of stuff. Like, I think there's a, a lot of really good stuff that can be done using those heuristics and preventing the failure conditions. Is that Hopi grandmother, like, does it grow corn? Does it grow corn, right? Can it produce children who grow up to be good kids, yeah. right? That kind of stuff. And of course, the point there is that because that gives you a checksum. You know, if, if you're evolving in a 
simulation of coherence, but you can't actually resolve just basic stuff in yourself. But you can always just teleport back to New York and have your basic stuff nobody notices. Anybody can fake it for 60 days. But if you actually have to raise children together, okay, reality is going to tell you whether or not you actually delivered on the thing. Yeah. Does it grow corn? Hope your grandmother. Nice. I'm stealing that. Oh, yeah. It's one of the interesting things in a world where the market has subsumed almost everything is the difference between production and extraction has become unclear most places. And so someone can do well financially without actually growing any real corn by manipulating markets, by manipulating marketing. Financial services are mostly that type of phenomena. Marketing is mostly that type of phenomena. And so someone can have a false sense of being a success that their ideas work because they're financially successful, though they have been net entropic to the world. Their work has actually been net entropic. Mm -hmm. That's actually that whole notion you've been describing. You, you, you've shared that with me recently. I've been thinking it ever since you first said it. But the idea that wisdom has been subject to kind of, I don't know what exact phrase you use, like capture by the market. Yeah. Can you speak more to that? Because I mean, obviously you're talking, you were talking about discernment and you're saying, hey, um, if you want to show up and be a good person and trust that, right, trust the Omega principle, but not everybody else is playing that, you're undone. Yep. And then you've been thinking through even the signifiers of wisdom that are available, which would hopefully increase people's discernment, have gone tits up. I mean, Jordan mentioned it earlier when he was talking about take a teaching from Jesus or from anyone and then see what game A does with it when it becomes like how the teachings of the guy who emphasized forgiveness became the basis of the Crusades and the Inquisition is like a really great example. Like how the fuck did we figure out how to do that? And um, so there's still a similar thing that happens when if someone makes their living by sharing wisdom and they're able to split test optimize the nature of what wisdom people respond to the most and what persona expressions and they can click optimize and they can even just allow Facebook's algorithms to click optimize the version of wisdom expression that lands the most. You get a, uh, a capture of wisdom by rivalrous games. And this is the kind of shit we have to be like really honest with each other about and honest with ourselves about to create an in information ecology that doesn't have disinformation and bullshit in it. Because right now, like if, if true information about reality is a s source of competitive advantage within rivalrous games, then I both want to withhold mm. true information and I want to disinform. And I want to miss signal. Wait, slow down there. Say all that again because that last two sentences felt like important. If true information about the nature of reality is a source of competitive advantage in a rivalrous game, I know where the water is and you don't, but if you go to where the water hole is, you'll fuck it up for me or whatever it is, then I want to not tell you where the water hole is. I also want to disinform you and tell you that it's somewhere else so you don't accidentally find it. I also want to maybe exaggerate the specialness of my knowledge so that I become the only bearer of water or whatever it is, right? So we have instead To not, not back to you, but to, to some other potential consumers. Right. Right, so you're, you're, this is potentially like rivalrous supposed wisdom keepers against each other. I mean, there's the kind of unwashed masses to which we flog shit. And it doesn't even have to be that conscious and intentional, right? It simply happens in the nature of, I want to get this message out there. Well, this version of it is more acceptable and it gets out there better, And right? So then there's this kind of multipolar trap degeneration of the content to be susceptible to broadcast and susceptible to mainstream ability, a premature focus on scaling, in which case split-tested analytics. And, and then what that means is I'm compelling people to listen, which is the opposite of supporting their sovereignty. Yep. I'm actually figuring out causal psychological manipulations to manipulate their choice to do the thing I want them to do rather than inf try and support the sovereignty of their choice making. Yeah, it's a pain in the ass. But we have to, like, every single time we go through, the, like, when you think about these kinds of problems, you, at least for me, I keep coming back to the same basic place. So, obviously, the prophylactic against this entire thing is just, you know, broadcast. Right? As soon as wisdom is, in fact, just lived relationally. It's why, it's why Landmark is bigger than Vipassana.
right? I mean, they've gone, they've gone, they've diluted to lowest common denominator. They've, they've made no bones about putting people in exposed vulnerable states and upselling the living shit out. Yeah, if it's transactional, yeah. it, there's gonna be problems. If it's broadcast, there's gonna be problems. I just have to speak to the irony of us talking about this on broadcast. Well, fortunately. Three white men specifically within about... About, about roughly the same age. I think we're actually the same person. <laughs> Well, I think the beauty of what's happening, though, is that it's so unlikely that anybody's actually going to have watched this video because it's so incomprehensible and just hard to follow that it's, it's actually not a problem. <laughs> uh, the, uh, what's interesting, I was just kind of thinking about that in terms of like the meta, is to the degree to which this is actually interesting at all, what I would say is that this is genuinely just a conversation. This is, I mean, for those who happen to be watching, this is straight up just exactly what a conversation, as fucked up as that is, <laughs> what we talk about. And this is no different, as far as I can tell. I and mean, I've had conversations with both of you and some conversations, the three of us together. Um, maybe a little bit more formal, but not a lot. I think it was a slower startup. Like we kind of, there was a little bit of... That's right, we didn't jump into it. Um, but this is more or less just what a conversation with us is like. So, but your point I think is quite, quite nice. Okay, cool. So what do we do heuristically? Like how do we actually prevent this from creating unintended negative consequences? So here's something I wanted to enter in that I didn't yet. And this was coming in from a completely oblique direction of anything we've talked about so far. But it has to do with what the motive for us doing any of it is. For doing any doing, actually. And so it has to do with the nature of desire. And this is something I... I find really fascinating. If you look at the beginning of, if you look at Buddha's noble truths and desire as the source of all suffering and as kind of a essential Eastern teaching, and then you look at desire as the cause of passion and creativity in Western teaching, there's a really big dialectic between those that's kind of worth navigating. And there's some deep ontology as to why in, why I model those differences. And so in a Western model made in the image and likeness of the creator, be creative. And desire is the source of the imagined, more beautiful, rich future for us to be creative, right? Eastern model, it has us disconnect from the fullness of the moment to imagine that a future moment could be more full and it actually makes us feverish and fucked up. And then when we get it, we're only happy for like a moment and then we want something else. Eastern model focused on being, which happens in the moment. Western model has a model of time that is reified, focused on doing and becoming, which is fulfilled in the future. And so, of course, I'm only happy for a moment that I want something else because becoming is actually what's relevant, becoming more and more full. One way I think about this is if I think about desire as like voltage, right? Like a, a pressure or a gradient for flow, a basis for movement, I can think about the low gradient inside of me and the high gradient in the world, some, some lack or emptiness in myself that creates a desire to get something from the world. Get recognition, get money, get sex, get attention, get something, right? And I think that Buddha was right to say that that is the cause of, or at least related with suffering. And it's kind of like, to the degree that I am affirming a sense of self that is in lack, I get more of that sense of self. To those who have, more shall be given. To those who don't have, the little they have shall be taken away, biblical quote. But we're having is like a state of experience, a state of consciousness. So then there is a different kind of desire that is not just no orientation for movement, which is an inner fullness that actually has an imperative to flow into the world. So there is a desire and there's a basis, but it's actually coming from wholeness, not from unwholeness. It's that Marley, Bob Marley, like my cup overfloweth, and I don't know what to do. Yeah, Hafez's poem, mm -hmm. I've become, this beggar has become so rich that my biggest problem now is emptying my emerald filled pockets into the world quickly enough. And so there's, if I'm coming from that place in the jam session, I can totally just let you jam if you're in a meaningful place. If I am coming from the other place and I need to be seen, then I'm gonna cut you off to make sure that I get seen or make sure that my lick was the best or something like that. And this is where the identities that are still 
seeking more and then can feel less in comparison to each other is the basis of rivalry that creates the fragility of the coherence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's such an interesting thing. Like the, um, yeah, I agree with you that that teaching is, let's just say, useful and works. That there's a way to actually recognize that you are capable of being full with simply in self. There's no need to have something from the outside to fulfill, but rather through doing something in self. And then when you're in that place, ah, this is actually very similar to what you were talking about when you talked about the, the least shitty to the most, to the, you know, when they're in high-low. There's actually a, a way of, of, of developing self so as to be able to, even when the interior of the self is actually lacking in some way, still to relate to that as full. Because the reality is, is you don't actually need that much. Very, very little, really. A minuscule amount, really. Um, particularly in contemporary environment. And so there's a disposition that can be achieved, which is nice. Like there's a disposition that allows you to then be in a relationship where that gradient form of desire is not have much traction. It does not pull. For me, at least, I can constantly feel it. There's a pull, but it does not have much pull. Um, and then I should mention, by the way, for me, at least, the training has also been having a noticing when it's going to build. Like, I'm thirsty now. Okay, well, I better take care of that. That actually is something that needs to be an actual conscious choice to satisfy a need. Now, this is the thing with your focus on sovereignty and starting at home that is so critical is because if I'm not tending to my own wholeness, I, I actually can't do any of the stuff we're talking about. Right, exactly. And then, and then what happens is, in my experience is that, is that every human being I've ever encountered is a cup overflowing. Yeah. Provided we're resourced, right? So, so my sense would be is that, is that you were describing some element of like, well, if you're Buddha, right, and you're completely understanding and you're purely coming from being, you've integrated the relation, the constant, you know, dialectic between being and becoming, then that's how you play the game. But like if we're talking about culture, architecture, and how do we actually get humans inculturated in game A with all the traumas of life, um, how are we helping us, you know, walk each other home, then I, I just keep coming back to that ocean notion of, of, you know, that gospel church, which is the, the idea like if we can have momentary, provisional, transient experiences of coherence, right, church, you know, the Holy Ghost feeling, right, and we can use that as metronome, ah, yes, I was off the one, now I'm back on the one, right, I remember, and a tuning fork, oh, I was banged and scraped this week, but man, I've just like, I've, you know, I've, I've, I've sweat my prayers, I've done whatever I've yeah, done, and then training wheels, now I, like MDMA therapy, right, now I feel resourced, I feel love, I feel connection, I feel coherence, and now let me go, and it might last me the next hour. It might last me all a Sunday. It might last me through hump day. Who the hell knows? But I get a little further each time mm -hmm. practicing. So rather than just, we got to do a whole bunch of hard, slow growing up to develop to the place where we might finally get to start practicing, can we do these in parallel? In fact, Bob Keegan at Harvard talks about that. Like, well, which is it? You know, is it tops down, bottoms up growth, mm -hmm. you know? And he's like, it's both, because that's how it's life really happens. Yeah. And if, but if we, and it feels to me like the piece that socially we're missing the most these days, to your point about Bali and Burning Man and, you know, transformational culture, is that people are really good at the atom bomb peak experiences these days. They can mm -hmm. blow shit up sky high. They're, shit, they're terrible at the other 360 days a year. The simple and, stuff. Yeah. And, Eat and right. So, sleep right. Yeah, you like the daily practice and like even like a revival of Meditate, collective breathe. Sabbath. Like collective Sabbath. That? Tone the bell. Yeah. Yeah, I've actually over the, I noticed it's such an odd thing for me is that um, I grew up in, in Texas in the 70s. So where prayer at mealtimes was actually very commonplace. But my family didn't practice that. So I had this experience of like, what the heck is that? And this was when... Uh, the move into secularism and even the new atheism was becoming part of the cultural fabric. So it was, what is that? And also a little bit of like, hmm, that's not cool. All right. And as I got older, that actually just kind of disappeared. But I've actually noticed over the past, what, maybe even four years, I've actually begun to build a prayer at mealtime practice myself. Mm -hmm. But from the inside out, meaning that it's not formal. It's not imposed. I'm not like re just reciting a script that I've learned. I haven't 
learned it. Rather, I had an insight, which was, oh, well, there's a lot of basic practices like feeling deep gratitude that are crucial. And you always have to eat. So I would always forget to have my gratitude practice. But when I said, you know what, I'm going to do this. Before I eat, I'm going to do my gratitude practice. I'm just going to bind something that just has this really cool characteristic of being really hard to forget, i.e. eating, with something that's really useful and has a little bit of cultural vector and just combine the two. And then it just began to expand from there. So this is, of course, the recreation of ritual that is also part of the story. Yep. And that's a lot of culture hacking we can do, right? I mean, I mean, yeah. grace, gratitude at dinner, um, Shabbos, you know, Sabbath, a day down, a down day every week to reflect and reset. Like these are simple things that are easy to dust off and reanimate. And I, and I really think, again, I think there's a lot that can be open sourced. We just have to make sure that we're not open sourcing the technology. We're open sourcing the technology to in, bring into insight. So don't open source the info open source the things that build developmental capacity. The generative process yeah. that led to the info. So when you said you didn't come back to prayer because you were deciding to adopt the tradition, but you discovered that that made sense. Yeah. And earlier you were talking about education that is not teaching info, but that is facilitating epiphany. Yep. When someone has real epiphany, and they figure out something that's useful, and then they teach other people, and the other people don't understand why, and that happens a few generations, the Dharma becomes dogma, right? Like the thing that, w that had real wisdom just becomes a thing to do because the authorities told us, and then liberation actually looks like rebelling against it. Mm -hmm. And even if we're submitting to it, we don't really get the gist. Mm -hmm. And so awesome. to not have Dharma become dogma and become a tr control system, it has to be Renewed. alive and real and rediscovered for everyone. Right. And that's a different process than mimetic transmission. Exactly. Mimetic transmission. Well, what about a catalytic mimetic? Because that has to be I know, a lot of good syllables. Doesn't it sound like? <laughs> um, no, truly. I mean, what, what, to your point about you're your giving, you're your disclosing the protocols for self-disclosure, that that could arguably be a catalytic mimetic. Principles more than protocols. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do more. I, I'm, I'm, I'm interested. I'd like. Or to even a mythopoetic catalytic mimetic. So, what is the story of how we begin to remember? And it's going to have to be again more in the direction of poetry, or yeah. the, the parable of how we begin to remember, yeah. so that it's hinting to people yeah. in themselves moments in their lives where they have, in fact come across, stumbled across, or opened into beginning to remember, such that they can find in themselves the thread that is theirs, so that they can begin to follow with greater clarity. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then fucking testify by their fruits. Right. And then we have to be very mindful of the fact that, you know, this is what, the twelfth time we've kind of gone through this cycle? On who's counting? Which? We got the Axial Age, we had the... Uh, Christian Islamic era, we had, you know, we had a series of points where there's like, a, okay guys, here's a whole new level up, you know, somebody has an epiphany, they have a real epiphany, it's for real, and they're like, all right, this time it's not turning into dogma, guys, let's get it right. Mm -hmm. The trick, of course, here is that we kind of have to. Okay, so this comes to what you were saying earlier that I wanted to comment on. I'm going to say something that will sound like really inspiring or depressing or ridiculous. Um, I'll go with ridiculous. Go. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to speak mythopoetically about the space that we're at, and we've talked about it like this before, is that exponential tech, the technology extends the power of our choice making. And, but our, we have tools that give us the ability to make better tools, that give us the ability to make better tools, so we have an exponential curve. It's just been very slow, and now it's not very slow. Now it's in the very quickly compounding place. And so we're getting exponentially larger levers on our choices, but we're not getting exponentially better choice making. And so we are getting the power of gods without getting the love or wisdom of gods to wield that power. That's a self-termination scenario. I don't see any scenario where we don't get the power of gods. That seems eminent and unavoidable. And so there really, like, there really is this enlightenment or bust thing that I see, which is 
if we have catastrophic level tech, not just isolated to state actors, but that can be radically decentralized, yeah. who gets to be totally fucked up? Nobody. Or even not be very omni-considerate that can do catastrophic stuff on accident. So this is like the existential bodhisattva? Yes, mm -hmm. it is. This is the bodhisattva imperative actually has to become universal for us to make it through this phase. And that wasn't true in the Bronze Age or Stone Age or Iron Age or any of the other ages because we could just kill a lot of people and we could destroy a lot of environments, and we did. Now it's just kill everybody in all environments. Right, so let's then jump back to the story I was trying to tell earlier quite poorly. So, zone of proximal development. We've all got that notion, right? That there's a, a place we could get to. Now let's think about the, the level up from homo habilis to homo sapiens, and the many, many different things that all had to come together simultaneously for that zone of proximal development to land. Right? You had to get neoteny and grandmothers and fathers and the emergence of the capacity for language and a certain affinity to not beat the shit out of other males as soon as you can counter them, like a whole bunch of stuff, each one of which independently isn't necessarily particularly useful. And any one of which lacking it, the thing doesn't hold together very well. Right? So you've got a bunch of like little micro versions of it that don't, that don't work and they fall apart until eventually you get to the zone of proximal development and then pop, it kind of pops together. I was thinking about that in terms of, okay, we've, we've, we're in this place where, all right, we're, we're, we're making another run at it. We're, we're, trying to get, we're trying to get to this spot. And the question is, well, was, what are the pieces? What are the pieces of the puzzle? And I was really interested in like noticing that we've got a whole bunch, and they come from lots of different places. You, know, you mentioned the Quakers and the Sioux. And we've talked about like Buddhism has stuff like non-attachment. Like one of the interesting traps, for example, as I was thinking through in terms of, like, okay, if I had an epiphany and I want to share it, and it turns to dogma. Well, one of the reasons why it turns to dogma is attachment. I want people. I'm attached to the good word. And so some interesting things about, okay, what's the toolkit? What are the pieces of this next stage that, if they come together, they mutually support each other, like the, that, that when people stand in a circle and they all kind of like turn and they begin to sit down simultaneously, where just perfectly as you begin to lose your balance, you sit and you land on somebody else's knees and it goes all the way around the whole circle. Like what's that thing where all the pieces come together and the stage now has the elements that support each other so we actually have reached a new place. Um, and what I notice is this, this really interesting thing where, like if I apply non-attachment and humility, by the way, which are really interesting cross products, like they're coming from very different lineages and they, they reinforce each other quite nice. So say them again, non-attachment and, and humility um, in the context of urgency. And in the context, by the way, of, you know, we've done a lot of conversations about the, if you really, really think clearly about the circumstances that we find ourselves in, even just the simple construction Daniel did of, as you're becoming more and more powerful, as you become unlikened to God in the direction of destructive capacity, if there's not an equivalent like unto God in the level of wisdom and care, you're likely going to fuck things up real quick. Um, you know, we've been through this many, many times. There's every construction you go through leads to the fact that we really don't have that much leeway. We don't have that much time. And the number of paths that are not, in fact, catastrophic are extremely narrow. Okay, well, hold that. That's true. Hold that. Hold the energy and the degree to which that creates a motivational push to cause you to just do stuff that is hard. At the same time, have both humility and non-attachment. Yeah, committed but non-attached. Yeah, those are the th and committed at a level of intensity that's like way up there and non-attached. Like that's the stuff that moves you to this point this singularity where the pop happens and the stage settles in. Yeah. This is the being-doing dialectic. Being grounded in a being that is actually full means unattached to needing fullness from the doing, achieving a particular thing. Mm. And yet, like a way I think about it is, there's a fullness of what is, but I... Stop thinking about reality as a noun and think about it as more verb-like. I can have a fullness with what is, and I can also recognize an evolutionary trajectory. I can recognize the beauty of life and be nourished by it, and I can also know that it's mine to add to the beauty of life as best I can. And that's being.
appreciating the beauty of life, doing, adding to the beauty of life, becoming, increasing our capacity to be and do at greater depth. Rebel Wisdom is a new sense-making platform, bringing together the most rebellious and inspiring thinkers from around the world. If you're enjoying our content, then you can help us make more by becoming a subscriber, which will give you access to a load of exclusive films. Also, you can then join our group Zoom calls to discuss the ideas in the films, and you can send us ideas for questions for upcoming interviews. We're also looking for talented people to help us out with editing, graphics, music, that kind of thing. And if you're a regular viewer, you'll know we talk a lot about the value of embodying or actually living out the ideas that we talk about. So that's why we run regular events in London. Check out the links on the website for more. And hope to see you soon.